A very good morning and a warm welcome to the Centre for Army Leadership's second conference of 2021, Culture and Leadership. My name is Lieutenant Colonel Langley Sharp, SO1 Leadership here at the Cal. We have the honour of welcoming over 5,000 people who have signed up for today's event, representing not just the breadth of the British Army, but also an estimated 700 cross-sector organisations which will not only add significant value to our discussions, but also provides a valuable opportunity to learn from one another. But of course, this day will be nothing without our fantastic panel of speakers, each and every one a leader in their field across academia, sport, business, and of course, the military. By way of framing the context of today's conference, I have set out several questions. First, what is culture? Well, much like leadership, it defines a universally agreed definition, but I've opted for the following by um, Eldridge and Crombie, who almost 40 years ago now argued, the culture of an organization refers to the unique configuration of norms, values, beliefs, ways of behaving, and so on, that characterize the manner in which groups and individuals combine to get things done. This distinctiveness of a particular organization is intimately bound up with its history and the character building effects of past decisions and past leaders. Which neatly prompts my next question. What is the relationship between leadership and culture? Well, it's symbiotic. It is our people, our leaders and followers who shape the culture of our organization through the accumulation of everyday actions and behaviors, through what we do and say, or indeed what we don't do and don't say. Equally, it is the cultural norms manifesting in our values, traditions, artifacts, symbols, rules and, uh, rules and regulations that in turn shape our behaviors. Indeed, it is worth reflecting on what we have in the British Army, a 360 year old institution, which has bred a rich mosaic of cultures and subcultures exemplified through the regimental system that directly affects not only our daily lived experience, but more fundamentally, our very identities. Leadership affects culture as much as culture affects leadership. But why do both matter to the British Army? Well, first, because we have a moral duty, a moral obligation to serve our people, to both do right by them, ensuring that every individual feels valued and adds value, as well as to maximize the potential of our principal capability, our soldiers and civil servants across the whole force. And secondly, because leadership and its inherent relationship with culture is the essential component that underpins our operational effectiveness, the interconnected physical, conceptual and moral properties of our fighting power. Why are we discussing culture and leadership now? Well, this conference has been long in the planning, but its timing could not be more opportune. Last week, as many of you know, saw the release of the Army's Future Soldier, an ambitious strategy that will see the most significant transformation of our organization in a generation. As Chief of the General Staff has stated, transformation on this scale also requires cultural change. 
Future Soldier is not just about structures and equipment, it is about mindset and leadership. And as recent events have demonstrated, while there is much in both our culture and of course our leadership that we must be proud of, we have our areas of improvement. As identified in the Wigston report on inappropriate behaviors, the House of Commons Defence Committee report into women in the armed forces, as well as a small number of high profile leadership failings at various ranks. It is important that we own these issues, that we, that we take account for them together, and that we continue to drive changes we need. We all have a responsibility. Furthermore, while such issues are a focus for the British Army now, we are by no means alone in the myriad of challenges we face. We live in a world that is changing at pace. Social, economic, political, technological, and of course, cultural uh, ch changes are shining a spotlight on the values, norms, and expectations across every, uh, every organisation and across every sector. But equally, we must not, not lose sight of what we have. We must be proud of our operational pedigree, our collective capability, and most importantly of all, our loyal, hardworking and talented people. It is they who make the difference, and it is they who will make the changes we need. Everyone has a personal responsibility to evolve the leadership and the culture we need to succeed in the future. So what are we doing about it? Well, first we need to raise awareness and promote honest, balanced, and informed debate and discussion, hence the importance of events such as today. Secondly, the extensive work led by the Army Headquarters on our organizational culture, establishing a new framework that will define, measure, and in turn drive a culture that delivers improved performance and enhance operational effectiveness. And you'll hear more about that later on today. And thirdly, Project Bramall, an ambitious exco endorsed project that seeks to cohere leader development across the Army. By that, we mean a renewed focus on developing the individual needs of leaders across all ranks and grades. The project will be underpinned by bespoke research, a leader competency framework, enhanced doctrine, and further development of our training and education offer, both uh, formal and that enabled through the chain of command. If our people are our competitive edge, we need to develop and appropriately manage the individual, the leader. And in so doing, we will continue to professionalize uh, our collective capability, our leadership. And finally then, what can you do about it? Well, the first step is ownership. We all have a role to play. We all have responsibility. And it starts here today. Today is an opportunity to listen, understand, debate and discuss as we collectively reflect on the culture of our organizations, whichever you may represent, and the role that uh, leadership, specifically your leadership, has to play in striking the balance between our past, present and future, and in so doing, contributing to an evolution that not only serves our moral obligations to our people, but continues to define our operational success. I do hope you enjoy today's conference. So without further ado then, it is my pleasure to introduce the chair of this morning's session, Deputy Assistant Chief of Staff Personnel in Headquarters Field Army and Co-Chair of the Army Service Women's Network, Colonel Hannah Stoy. Colonel, over to you. Good morning. I'm honored to be hosting this morning's session, the first of two sessions of today's Culture and Leadership Conference. Today, we're gonna to journey through the academic perspective to the practitioner and military view. We're looking to reflect what our current understanding and definition of culture and leadership is in the context of the military and specifically the British Army. Challenge some of our views to see whether we're outdated, about right, or need a systematic overhaul. And most importantly, consider in the context of our own lives and working environments, what we can do to improve. We have a superb lineup this morning. And once we've heard from each of our speakers, we'll bring all of them back together to address some of your questions. So can I encourage you to sit back, turn off any distractions and engage in what promises to be a thought provoking and hopefully challenging day. 
Professor Adrian Furnham is an award-winning author and world-leading chartered occupational psychologist and chartered health psychologist. He is currently an adjunct professor at BI Norwegian Business School and a professor at University College London. Professor Furnham has a broad range of research interests within the field of psychology. He has explored topics within the applied economic, health, occupational, social, and differential psychology. He has written over 90 books and published over 1,200 scientific papers on a variety of subject matters, including personality at work, motivation and performance, the incompetent manager, and high potential. Today, he is going to set out the foundations for us and define culture and leadership. Professor Adrian, welcome. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, great pleasure to be here, and I hope you can hear me talk. I'm going to say just two words about culture very specifically. First of all, I think all organizations have multiple cultures, and I'm sure you'll recognize that. Not always very different, sometimes very different. And the other thing is to mention the very famous phrase by Drucker many, many years ago, that culture eats strategy for breakfast, meaning how important it is. I'm going to look at a slightly different aspect of culture uh, in due course. Um, this is me just showing off. Uh, these are the books I've written uh, this year. And as you'll see on the right is uh, one on leadership. I should say rather arrogantly that I go into a place called the real world from my academic uh, uh, castle and do various types of consultancy. And so these are some of my clients. This says my wife is a manifestation of subclinical narcissism, which you will see is relevant uh, later. I want to say a little word, a word about what I'll call no more heroes and a rather old fashioned uh, view of, of leadership. I think over the last 30 years, we've seen uh, our heroes, political, economic, and so forth, and they fall into uh, a pretty clear uh, category, male, alpha, competitive, top-down, there they all are. Um, they're business people. Uh, you can add many to the list. And, you know, some people would argue there's still very much in evidence that the young leaders, here are some photographs you'd recognize, are still by and large male and alpha and competitive and personality driven and so forth. However, the world is changing. Uh, we know that. Some of us welcome it, some not so much. And we are seeing different faces uh, in the world of leadership, uh, some quite uh, significantly different faces. I think there are a few trends in leadership, uh, and I want to mention one or two of them because they're relevant to my central theme. Uh, we hear a lot of uh, work about diversity. Uh, the psychologists call this heterogeneity as opposed to homogeneity. It, it's on difference. You and I differ from one another in many ways. We differ in terms of our height, in terms of our values, in terms of our ethnicity, and so forth. And I think what we've seen in the past is that people who have ascended to positions of leadership in many organizations tend to be very similar. They choose each other and they se select each other for certain characteristics. That is changing. More focus on purpose and meaning. And I've highlighted a few important ones. Uh, the one is less on charisma and more on humility. That's my central point, if you like. And the importance of team and collective. We heard about the famous three circles model. I'm gonna show you three circles in a minute and the emphasis on some other aspects of teamwork. I do some work uh, for the British Army. I lecture on a number of courses. I was very fortunate years ago to uh, have as a colleague, Norman Dixon, the man who wrote the very famous book called The Psychology of Military Incompetence. And his work inspired my ideas on leadership. He looked at famous British military disasters. I think it's probably true to say the British tend to win wars but lose some battles. And he looked at the battle of, you know, the fall of Singapore with Percival and the battle of Slandwana with Cheltenham and the battle of Kut and tried to understand why leaders fail and derail. And that's my topic. And I think uh, will be relevant to what we're going to talk about as a theme for today. 
I rather like this definition of leadership. It's from my friend and colleague, Robert Hogan. And he says this, leadership is the ability to form and motivate a talented team that is more successful than its competitors. Amen. Leadership is a team sport. It's your ability to form and maintain and motivate a team. And of course, according to uh, the uh, um, structure of the army, the size of your team increases as does your, your rank. Now, some years ago, I heard this wonderful uh, lecture by a, a, a man, it was, we were in Abu Dhabi. And he said, you know, there are only three types of jobs. There are technical jobs, supervisory jobs, and strategic jobs. You tend to be hired for your technical knowledge. You go to university and you learn stuff and you become an engineer or a dentist or an accountant or something, and they select you. You look right, you seem to have the right attitudes, and you have the right knowledge. And what happens after a while, if you're good, if you're successful, they promote you. What do they promote you into doing? Into not doing the technical stuff. You liked doing your dentistry and your engineering. You're good at that. You like the numbers, you like the strategy. But one day they said, okay, stop that. Go run the department. I'm promoting you to leadership. I'm promoting you to manager. And that's different. It's a different activity, a quite different activity. You stop doing what you're so good at and like doing and manage, lead people. And if you're good at that, then you're promoted again to strategy, to something higher, to the big picture stuff. And who said you can go from one to the other? So this is my equivalent of the three circles model you were, you were talking about. I think there's three things you have to do as a leader. You've got to keep the show on the road, deliver the results, whatever they are. You've also got to motivate people and you've got to do some sort of strategy all at the same time. And that's where the problem arises because my experience, at least in the business world, is of technical people becoming not very happy managers, um, that they don't like the, the business of management. They're not naturally good at it. And that you've got to keep these three balls in the air, exactly with the model you were talking about, at the same time. Now, I'm going to say a little bit about this, about, you know, leaders, you know, can you select them or can you train them? Born or made, a classic old question. Well, should we know some answers to that question? We, there's some wonderful data. In fact, it's based on female leaders on identical twins separated at birth. So you can actually tease out to what extent there's some genetic factor and to what extent there's some environmental factor. Well, what I think is very interesting in is how you, how you train leaders. You know, what, how do you train them? Well, I think there's only three ways of essentially do it. And the one is experiential. And I think the military are past masters of that. You give people experience, you go on training exercises. And in business, what they tend to do it is give people assignments, move them around. So the learning is experience. You do something, and if it goes wrong, maybe paradoxically all the better. There's some interesting work to suggest that you learn more from your mistakes and your errors and what goes wrong than from successes. Success teaches you nothing. Failure teaches you a great deal. And so there's an experiential way of learning leadership. There's also educational, this sort of thing. Can you teach people to become leaders by PowerPoint? Well, I don't know. Can you teach people to ride a bicycle, fly a helicopter by PowerPoint, play the piano? No, you can teach them concepts and skills, but what can you teach by PowerPoint? And then there's the question of some sort of personal mentoring. So, where have we got to so far? Very important leadership. It's a team sport. It involves three things. It involves operations, teamwork, and strategy at the same time. And yet, so many leaders fail and derail. And I want to look at this particularly, because I think in this, we have great insight to success. And this is on an individual level and a corporate level. A huge number, you know, the question I, I asked, I was giving a live talk, believe it or not, yes, surprise, surprise, in uh, Oslo two weeks ago. And my first question was, 
how many American CEOs are in prison? Anyone want to guess? Write it down. I'm a bit out of date. The answer was 37 a few years ago. These are people, this is a real sign of failure. It's not just the company failing, they're in prison. So why is it that organizations like the military spend a huge effort finding, selecting, and training people, and yet it goes wrong? Is it the corporate culture that selects them inappropriately, trains them inappropriately? So that's what I'm going to spend a little bit of time on. If you want to become a consultant, you've got to be able to do this. You've got to be able to do a two by two, it's called. You know, good and bad, select, reject. And this is the business of the selection of potential leaders. It's a very interesting topic. All organizations are interested in this. I've developed measures of people with high potential and the things you look for, etc. But I think what goes wrong in many organizations, possibly still in the British military and other militaries, I don't know, is that what you have is you have some options. You have, let's be crude about it, you have good people and bad people, you select and reject. And the idea of good selection is selecting the good people. Whoever the good people are, you select the right people. And that's what you're trying to do. If you don't select the good people, and we've all made bad decisions, we're not good at selection, are we? What are the divorce statistics in Great Britain? 50%. You spend a lot of effort and a lot of time choosing potential mates, and yet we get it wrong. We sometimes don't select the right people, or we select the wrong people. But this is a very important slide for one reason, and that it suggests that there are two issues going on here, selecting in and selecting out, and that you need to do both to have a good corporate culture. They say in HR, you know, here are the things you need to look for, here are the competencies, they're terribly important, these are unique to us, I don't ever believe that by the way, they're unique to us and unique to our culture, find evidence of these, find lots of evidence of these, and this is the solution. You've got to have a very careful selection technique which selects in. I think you need to think about selecting out. I'll say more in a minute about this. I want to say two other things, and this goes back to my friend uh, Norman Dixon and his military incompetence. I think there are two reasons why leaders fail and derail. One is incompetence, they're lacking something. They're not bright enough, courageous enough, emotionally stable enough, conscientious enough. They don't appear to have some characteristic which may be uh, warfare brings up in them, they're missing something, and they've been over-promoted. That was one of the arguments with Percival at the fall of S Singapore. I know some of you know a great deal about this, but it's a very interesting argument, Chelmsford at the Battle of Assange Loana, that these were leaders who were over-promoted, they just lacked something. I'm not interested in that particularly, I'm interested in something else, leaders who have too much of something, not not enough, too much. Here's some data from business. It's old data. It's up to the year 2000-ish. Um, uh, I say to people when I do seminars, I say, you know, all organizations appoint leaders and they're not any good. They, they cock up, they fail. What percentage do you think occurs? What percentage of people are promoted to, selected for senior leadership positions? And they say 10%, 5%. That's the statistics, 50, half, half of people seem to fail, derail, not succeed, bad appointments. This is very important. If you're interested in leadership, why do we get it wrong so often? Why is it, and we've all had them, we have been, we have worked for, reported to people who really haven't got it in some way, or they've got too much of something else. Now, the work, I think that is of particular interest, and I'm going to spend more time on this now and slow down slightly, and that is on what we know about people who, because of their personality, are selected for positions, but don't make good leaders. And I'm going to particularly look at narcissism, narcissistic leaders, um, and other psychopathologies. 
about 10 years ago, the psychologists and the psychiatrists have been have had lots of fights about personality and personality disorders and so on and so forth. And there's always been a problem with psychiatrists in, um, in diagnosis, the unreliability of diagnosis. And then one person asked a simple question. They said, of the characteristics of what I'm going to talk about, the personality disorders, I'm going to talk about leaders who are narcissists, leaders who are psychopaths. What are the characteristics which underlie these individuals who are not successful? And the answer was three things. And I want you to remember these. This is the most important slide of my contribution when thinking about leadership. There are three things you need to look out for that is bad news. Number one, troubled relationships. Has this individual got a history of troubled relationships, inside work, outside work, in the past, from school, university, early days, is that yes, people get divorced, yes, people break up, yes, introverts don't have as many friends as extroverts, all that is true. But what we do know is one of the great markets of a leader's ability to do the soft stuff is the ability to establish and maintain happy, healthy, productive relationships working relationships, personal relationships. If an individual has a history of troubled relationships, your warning sign should go on, bad news. Next, do they know themselves? Have they got a sense of their strengths and, strengths and, well, developmental opportunities? Do they know what they're good at? Do they know what they're not good at? Do they know how to compensate? You know, a, a great amount of uh, exercises, at least from my point of view, being a psychologist, is to help people with self-awareness. I have a coaching exercise tomorrow with somebody, and I'm going to have to give this very senior leader some really rather bad news, because what he thinks his strengths are, I don't think are at all. And I don't think he is particularly self-aware in a particular aspect. So the question is, do they know, have they got a sense of who they are and are they insightful to their strengths and weaknesses? And I think, you know, then the question is, it's a long question, it's whether you should work on your strengths or work on your, your weaknesses. I've long believed, I was brought up, some of you can hear my colonial accent, I am a uh, the, the child of a, of, a, of a missionary in Africa, and I was brought up to look at your weaknesses, confront your weaknesses and do something about them. I don't believe in any of that anymore. I believe in finding out what I'm good at and then what I'm not good at and finding ways of help other people helping me to do what I'm not good at. I don't think I'm gonna necessarily improve there. So self-image is important. And the third one is adaptation. Can people adapt to changes? Is there evidence? You know, as you get older, change is more difficult, more problematic. But I think what we need to look for is, can people establish relationships? Do they know? Are they self-aware? And you'll see in a moment why, why bad leaders are not self-aware. And it, do they have this thing called adaptability, flexibility? This is very important. These are really crucial issues. So I think the selection goes wrong for three reasons. We select in and select out. We look for things we want, who looks for things we don't want? Who on the selection board does that? We assume linearity. It's another very important idea. It's that you can never have too much of a good thing. You can never be too bright, too emotionally intelligent, too empathic. Yes, you can. You want optimal, not maximal. And that's a very important idea. When looking for characteristics, extremes of anything, one definition of extremes of normal are abnormal. You can be abnormally tall. You can be abnormally strong. You can be abnormally bright. And some of these things don't work. And we tend to be dazzled by positive things and therefore think that the more, the better. The evidence suggests optimal, an ideal amount is an optimal height. Very tall people have all sorts of problems as do very short people. And so you want this concept of optimality. So there we are. Uh, let's do a little bit of work. This is the idea of um, normality and, and the normal distribution. Where are you? If I said to you, I play a little game with my students. I do this, in fact, 
when I teach uh, um, um, in, in Shriven, uh, what I do is I say to people, how, you know, how bright are you? You know, what, what's your score? Yeah, tell me how bright you are. And then I give them intelligence tests. So this is what you think you are. This is what the test says you are. Are you right? Are you a victim of hubris? Do you believe you're brighter than you are? Or are you a victim of humility? I'm gonna say something now, which uh, perhaps I shouldn't and might embarrass people. The people I taught, teach on this course are usually uh, uh, colonels, some brigadiers um, from all the armed services. And because I give people the intelligence test to illustrate this point, I must say, I've been astonished by two features of the British army one and Navy and Air Force, the British Armed Forces, is one, how clever senior military officers are. They're as le least as bright as my PhD students. I know because I give them tests. And there's one other very, very important characteristic of the military in my experience, which is absolutely fundamental to a healthy culture. And that is the culture of always learning. The idea that whatever rank and status you are, you are still on a course. I go to so many institutes and say, well, you know, I went to Oxford and I went there and I'm sort of cooked. I've got the qualifications. I'm done with learning. I'm over 50. I'm done. It strikes me not at all the case with the British military who believe always you're on a training course. And I can't tell you how healthy I think that is, that whatever your rank and your status, you're on, a, you're on a trajectory, you are learning. I think it's absolutely fundamental. Okay, well, one of the reasons I think why um, leaders fail and derail is that they've got what the psychologists call the personality disorders. And when I say to my, uh, my, my colonels on this particular course, you know, what characteristic do you least want in your, in, your, in your senior officer, the person to whom you report? What is it that you least want? And they all shout out arrogance. It's very interesting. They don't always shout this out in, in business, but they shout out arrogance. And that alerts me to something I'm going to talk about in a moment. I was at, uh, on a course oh, before COVID. And what interested me was, uh, it was uh, a man I don't remember much about him, and he said, oh, I, you know, I've just been moved somewhere, and my, my boss, the senior officer, came, and he said, you know, I only ask uh, two questions of, um, of my boss. Uh, is he any good? Is he competent? Uh, does he know what he's doing? Is he, is he emotionally stable? So these are the characteristics one needs to look for in selecting out people. And I just want to spend a few more minutes on the concept of arrogance. Because if you go back to those leaders I talked about earlier, these are people in business, you see a characteristic which you know, academics would call hubris. And I think um, uh, ordinary, uh, psychiatrists would call narcissism, and you would call arrogance. Now, we psychologists have distinguished between two types of narcissism, grandiose narcissism and vulnerable narcissism. Think of Mr. Trump, if you want to think of a, of a, of a, uh, um, a sensitive narcissist, somebody who is vulnerable to critique, and Mrs. Clinton, who was grandiose. But they had characteristics which were very unattractive, and they were selected for them. Now, when we are looking for selecting out people, one of the things we tend to do is look for what are called the personality disorders. And bold is narcissistic, mischievous is psychopathic. Now, you know, people say, I say, well, what is a psychopath? And they all think of oh, the murder scene from, you know, psycho, you meet psychopaths with knives and showers. There are well over a million um, psychopaths, uh, clinical psychopaths um, in the world, in, in this country, if you look at the statistics, and some of them do very well. And some of them, and this is the worry, get into leadership positions. The characteristic, the abiding characteristic of a psychopath is not that they don't have empathy, which is what many people think, is that they don't have a conscience. They don't care. It doesn't worry them. 
And I say to people, you know, if you're bright, if you're articulate, if you're good looking, if you're strong, and if you're a psychopath, my goodness, you can do well in life. And equally, if you are narcissistic, the problem with narcissism is that you think when people appear to be extremely self-confident, so you have confidence, high self-confidence, cl subclinical narcissism, and then clinical narcissism. And I want to end off a bit. So this is, I think, one of the big changes, and this is my contribution to the debate today about culture, from the, from the culture of charisma to the culture of humility. When you've heard the stuff about humble leaders. And what we know is this, that highly charismatic leaders may be more strategically ambitious, but less effective in day-to-day -day operations. They get promoted because they politic and network, and they're good at it, trying to please their bosses, managing up, rather than being concerned with those who work under them. That's why you discover things by this 360. This is you, this is your boss, these are your peers, these are your subordinates. You get a, if you get a different, very different picture from what the boss thinks of an individual to what the reports think, I think you might be, be uh, dealing with a narcissist. Leaders also create the culture of competition, ambition, and narcissism. Leaders create cultures. They, they are chosen by a, a system which perpetuates the culture. And it's the culture of narcissism, the culture of grandiosity, the, grand, the culture of me. Why are narcissists bad news? Well, it's all about me. It's not about you. It's not about the organization. It's not about the troops. It's not about our country. It's me, my future, my promotion. It's very unattractive. Do you trust him? You know, remember what the soldiers said to me, the leader arrives, do you trust him or her? Are they competent? And trusting is a very important issue. The characteristic people most want in their leader, by the way, is integrity. What about humility? What about humble leaders? You know, we have a view of humility of Uriah Heap. It's not that. It's humble leaders are people who, I think, focus on others more than on themselves. They tend to be more modest. They, they're self-aware. We're not all good at everything. We might be good at a few things, but they tend to be more modest. And higher levels of humility lead to greater levels of engagement. Humility is not something that involves putting yourself down all, all the time. I think it involves being focusing on other people and being more concerned with the goals of the organization. So finally, I think I'm on time. I've been very impressed so far by how good timekeeping has been, but I expect that uh, from my experiences of the army. Uh, leadership is not a fad or a fashion. There's evidence of what good leadership looks like, but as the world changes, maybe leadership style changes. I think what leaders do will always be the same. We've had, we've had uh, long uh, histories of people looking at, at different leadership styles and so forth. I think there is now, a powerful movement throughout the world and in organizations for a different leadership style. Personality is important in understanding leaders, I think, for their potential success and derailment. I think we need to know, and you see, oh, you're a professor of psychology, you would expect to say that. Indeed, I do. But remember my point. When you're looking at people's personality, look for the personality you want and look for the personality you don't want. It's not the opposite. Not, it, it's not not enough of something, it's the presence of something else. Selecting in and selecting out is important when choosing future leaders. Selection's only the first step. Selection's only the first step. And sometimes, and people might talk about this later, people spend a lot of effort in getting people from very different backgrounds to join the organization. But the culture is so strong that they leave that organization, that the culture of the way in which people are trained and assessed and developed comes from the past. So you get new people in with a rather different perspective, but the old culture ways drives them to leave. Leadership development is a journey, not a destination. It's an old line, but it's an important one. Uh, there is a move away from a, from a hubristic, narcissistic, bullying and dominant style of leadership. I don't think it was ever important. And you've seen wonderful case studies in the military and elsewhere of wonderful leaders. Leaders, you know, the idea is that their troops would follow them anywhere. 
And many of you know, I think uh, uh, Slim would be a, a wonderful example of a leader of this of his characteristic, that their empathic, uh, their empathy, their humility shines through them and people will follow them anyway. Their, their, their staff are committed and enthusiastic. And finally, there's a need for more diversity in leadership, heterogeneity of all sorts. And I think the personal qualities we need to look for. I think I speak as a pale, frail, stale male, and we've been in charge for all sorts of periods of time. The, there will be, there will be uh, some difficulty in moving away from this model. So let me do, summarize in, in, in one moment. I think the culture of organizations is enormously powerful. But there are multiple cultures, and I don't think you can easily talk about the culture of the army or the culture of the military. There are multiple cultures, although there might be things in common. Those cultures are very powerful because they dictate how you select and how you train future leaders. And I think looking at the, some of the values uh, of, of, of the individuals who do the selection and do the training and the way they select and the way they train future leaders might be the best way uh, to move forward. So I thank you. I'm two minutes over and I look forward to questions afterwards. Professor Adrian, thank you so much. Uh, and there was far too much in that for me to even begin to try and summarise. But suffice to say, I think there is a fair reflection for all of us uh, to consider what our own leadership style looks like and how we might develop that. As you say, the world around us changes. Our next speaker this morning joined the army in 1997 as a combat engineer and an electrician in the Royal Engineers. He has excised around the world and on operational tours in Macedonia, Kosovo, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Promoting through the ranks to be the third army sergeant major, he's a graduate of the intermediate command and staff course and has a BA in leadership and management. This morning, WO1 Paul Carney will consider the Army's culture from a soldier's perspective, talking on bottom-up leadership. Army Sergeant Major. Thank you, Ma'am. Um, good morning, everyone. It's uh, a real honor to be able to come and speak to you today uh, amongst some very, very talented individuals. And I guess that means that I kind of bring the practitioner point of view next to the likes of the doctors and, and the other speakers. Um, just for a little bit of awareness about me, I'm the senior soldier of the British Army, and I work directly for our senior commander, the Chief of the General Staff, General Mark Carlton Smith. My primary role is the, the voice of the soldier, and as a workforce advisor to CDS, acting as a connective tissue between our planning and delivery teams in the Army headquarters and our units that deliver our tactical outputs. I balance my, team between, uh, my time between those two groups to ensure that I can offer the best advice and support both up and down the chain of command. I'm gonna talk about for about 15 to 20 minutes on how the army culture uh, looks from a soldier's point of view and how we can enhance it with the bottom-up leadership, helping to shape, reinforce, maintain the culture for the future. I'll begin this by discussing the British Army has been built on our junior non-commissioned officers and how integral that is to adapting and maintaining the correct culture. I'm then gonna finish off with the importance of developing a true understanding of our people and the ability to build in challenge. Now, the success of an organization depends on its culture and never is that truer than in the military. We have to acknowledge that we're quite a unique organization in that we not only work, but socialize and live together. Our regular forces assigned to a contract of indefinite liability and must be prepared to work 24 seven to defend and support our country and to be experts at the profession of arms. Our metric of success is being operationally effective for our government and everything we do hinges on delivering that. This means that we are a people focused organization and to get the best from our people, we must look after them and give them the opportunity to be able to operate without experiencing bullying, harassment or discrimination. To aid that focus, the British Army has been built around the regimental system. Most people will recognize the system for the variety of cap badges and the forms of dress, but it's so much more than that. The system establishes a unit's identity, providing a subculture within the framework of the Army's own culture. It helps to build fight and spirit, cohesion and teamwork. 
They come steeped in customs, history, and traditions. Our most famous is probably the Guards Battalions that have existed for almost 400 years, and who many of us would have seen in their red jackets and their bearskins protecting the Queen's residence. Another example is the Parachute Regiment. Its reputation earned from campaigns in World War II, the Falklands, Iraq, and Afghanistan, coupled with their distinctive maroon beret, parachute wings, and the Pegasus, form symbols and achievements that inspire those that serve today to maintain the high standards that their predecessors set. This is one of the great strengths of the regimental system. But without the right leadership, the system has its own weaknesses. Passing poor behaviors off as traditions, stovepiping ideas, and creating a them and us culture that negates the ability to work as a bigger team. We have seen this replicated in the sports world. This was probably best seen during the golden era of English football between 2001 and 2007, where our club football teams like Man United, Liverpool and Chelsea provided some of the best players in a generation. But when they came together as, an England, uh, as England, they lacked the cohesion, preferring to mix with their club teammates rather than build on the national team. This led to an England team of high expectations getting no further than the quarterfinals of three tournaments. Now it's funny that it took a team of civilians developing the British Army advertising campaign in 2017 to really help us understand what uh, one of the largest parts of our culture is. The campaign was titled Belonging. It demonstrated to me in one word why we join and serve the army. We're a group of people that will fight for our friends to the left and right of us. Our friends, our team, are the ones that get us through the hardships of life, either in the UK or whilst deployed on operations. And we all want to belong to something that is much bigger than ourselves. When you speak to veterans, the biggest thing they miss as a civilian is being amongst the military friends who they shared tough times and good experiences. Now, our culture is built on a set of values, beliefs, attitudes, and ethos to help shape our collective identity. That culture informs our behavior and in turn informs the lived experience of our whole workforce. We are diverse by design, recruiting from all over the world, from the mountains of Nepal to the beaches of the Caribbean and from all four corners of the UK. We recruit from different genders, religions, educational and socially economic backgrounds. So those who join the army come from almost everywhere. Although through that diversity, we tend to have two common traits. One is the desire to join an organization that supports and serves our country. And the other is to try and improve ourselves. And as an organization, we have a very short time to turn that diverse group of civilians into a collective group of soldiers. Building and maintaining the right culture in our army must always be a bottom up endeavor. This doesn't negate the need from the highest echelons and our senior commanders to lead by example, to direct and resource the change in culture that we require. But in such a large organization, if it isn't embraced and developed by our most junior leaders, it will never work. I think this was best demonstrated when the army soft launched its teamwork campaign based on building inclusion. It didn't get the uptake that we were expecting. Ordering people how to think and what to say will never change their mindset or our culture. We need them to understand why our culture and our values are important. You could say our junior commanders are our military influencers. If they demonstrate what is right, those actions become contagious and our soldiers will want to replicate them. Setting of the right culture begins in the British Army at basic training where we begin to embed the values and standards and the behaviors that we expect of our soldiers. We begin with using role models and mentors. Some of our very best junior NCOs become trainers in basic training. That gives our soldiers someone to look up to in turn and then want to replicate. These NCOs spend almost every waking hour with the new recruits, providing not only scheduled lessons, but a constant drip feeding of what is expected of our people and using live examples to develop them. Our values and standards are what we, what we stand for and underpin us as a profession of arms. 
Although you'd find it hard to find a soldier or an officer that can't recite our values of courage, discipline, respect for others, integrity, loyalty, and selfless commitment, and our standards of being lawful, maintaining an acceptable behavior, and being professional, doesn't mean that we have a true understanding of how to live by that. Developing that is unrealistic in the short period of time we have in basic training. So we must continually be discussed and worked on. Now this education is one that will be lived and developed throughout a soldier's career. When you pull apart our values and standards, you begin to understand the depth that is held within them. Loyalty is a great example of this. When we teach our soldiers to be loyal, is it to themselves? Is it to their families, their civilian or military friends? And when they're in a unit, is that to their section, the platoon, the company or the battalion? Just ask yourself, if you witness a close friend breaking a rule, will you break their loyalty if you go to their chain of command? Our NCO skills are built through our vocational or field courses. They're hardened through personal experience and training and cohered with some academic training through the Army Leadership and Development Programme. And then we back that up with our leadership doctrine, which has been updated in the second copy released this year. The doctrine provides our soldiers and officers with the leadership code, a simple framework to help our leaders turn our values and standards into actions. They fit into the acronym of leaders, which you can see on the presentation in front of you. The first one always stands out to me. As our NCOs are our, uh, as our NCOs are the people that we require to lead by example in front of our junior NCOs, we shouldn't underestimate the impact that that has on them as role models. I once had a soldier request to leave the army, which isn't uncommon. When I asked them why, expecting the usual answers of I want a new experience, I want to travel, or I need to be closer to my family, I was surprised to be told it was because he was intimidated and didn't feel that he'd be able to reach the caliber of two of the junior NCOs that he worked with. Now those junior NCOs had two very different styles of leadership, but both were great examples of what it takes to be a junior leader. Just as a side note, that soldier did stay in and has now become a very efficient junior NCO himself. Therefore, we must not underestimate the influence of our NCOs on our soldiers. Perception is key here. A soldier will only know what they know and what they see and feel. If a soldier in their small team never personally sees or works alongside someone different from them, their opinions can be formed purely on hearsay and stories. And those stories never tend to be good. We should continually develop our NCO's knowledge to understand the strengths of an inclusive team, the force multiplier effect it can, be, it can have on delivering output when everyone has the opportunity to thrive, and the impact on our operational effectiveness. If we aren't protecting each other, how can we expect to protect each other when we're on operations and build the trust that we need in our teams? The knowledge should always be backed up with continual development of leadership and communication skills so that we have the tools to deliver and enforce our messages. When we, end, when we, attempt, uh, excuse me, when we attempt to understand our people, we don't like to talk about individuals, but as groups, bracketing people by a supposed norm. In the military, we do this by cap badge that we wear, the ranks that we've earned, and our past experiences. I think by generalizing, we can learn false assumptions. I recently read that the Generation Z, the 11 to 24 year olds, is a digital native, someone who's activist, confident, outspoken, ambit ambitious, and wants to control their own destiny. Now it can be, it can be easy to assume that our future soldiers and recruits fall into this bracket. But this explanation doesn't take into account the digital poverty our country is seeing. Certainly through the, the COVID phase, a recent survey conducted by Lloyds Bank highlighted that digital poverty has a greater impact on those that have no or limited GCSEs. This, I think you'll agree, is an area that the British Army is renowned to recruit from. So we need to be careful about understanding the people we recruit. Every soldier I speak to has a different background, has a different reason for joining the army and has a different center of gravity. And what might motivate, educate and develop me won't necessarily work for them. Now our senior officers don't have time to understand such a large workforce as individuals. 
which is why it's important for our junior leaders to do so. Time spent on understanding where a soldier comes from, where they want to go, and how they want to get there will provide a framework from which to develop our soldiers to live by the culture that we expect. One of my biggest points as I move around the army is trying to minimize the say-do gap of developing a challenge culture in our units. The say-do gap is the length of time from talking about a good idea to it actually being implemented. Being able to confidently challenge is a great way in calling out and educating people on inappropriate behaviors, areas of safety that could save life, and can help us to become more efficient. Being part of a hierarchical organization where promotion is very important can be a real blocker and barrier to that. The mindset is established from our first day in basic training. When turning a civilian into a soldier, we tell them to do as they're told and listen in. And at that early stage of their career, that's really important for safety issues in the short time that we have to build a soldier, a civilian into a soldier. And it helps us build up a natural resilience to hardship. The next barrier is that we train our people to be highly competitive. We use sport, adventurous training, military competitions, and you could argue there's no greater competition than fighting for your life or the lives of others when you're caught in a firefight. The issue we have is being able to turn that competitive mindset off. In the same way that we train our soldiers on a bayonet range to be able to turn their aggression on and off, we have to train our people to be able to turn their pride and their competitiveness off, to be able to listen and to nurture that challenge. Accepting challenge is only half of the problem. We must also train our people to set the correct conditions to challenge. Someone calling me out in the middle of this presentation probably isn't the right time, but waiting for questions or at the end of the presentation is. Understanding the impact of not receiving challenge well can be difficult to recover from. We've all probably experienced that challenge in our personal lives with our friends or our partners. I know I certainly have. Whilst out walking the dogs, my wife caught me unaware and my natural defense has come up as I believed I was coming under attack. After the ensuing sulking and time to think over what my partner had said, I realized that she was right, which is usually the case. Imagine if I'd reacted that way in the workplace in front of soldiers. Not only could I have ignored some great advice, but now I've set the conditions where other people feel that they can't approach me and challenge me. I truly believe that if we can get this right for our organization, it could be a true force multiplier on building and maintaining the right culture in the British Army. I'm gonna wrap it up there. I think our junior leaders are important facilitators to ensure we create and maintain the right culture in the British Army. They're natural role models and influences to our junior soldiers. But this doesn't just come from goodwill. We must help them develop an understanding of why that's important and furnish them with the tools such as training and leadership, understanding and challenge, coupled with the skills to be able to communicate correctly. Thank you very much and have a great day. Sergeant Major, thank you very much. I mean, I think we've heard there very clearly the role of our junior leaders are the bedrock of our organization and how they influence and shape downwards uh, is as much uh, as is important as how they also assist those of us more senior in the organization to have a true understanding of what it's like to be in the British Army currently. I think also we've heard about the values and standards. Some of you, these may be new to, coupled with a leadership code. These are taught and practiced throughout our military service to ensure that actually we don't have to think about them and their second nature. And taking that culture uh, that then becomes ingrained in us onto the battlefield and on operations, our common code and our contract to one another on how we will conduct our business as prof professional service personnel. Thank you. Our next speaker this morning is Guardian columnist and author of A Strong Female Lead, Awa Madawi. Her book, published just five days ago, presents a compelling argument that in times of chaos, a female leadership model might be a more sustainable one. She is a brand strategy analyst and a freelance writer. Speaking on strong female lead, why we need to rethink our model of leadership, we look forward to Awa's alternative perspective. Awa, welcome. Good morning, everyone. I'll just uh, share my screen. Um, brilliant. So my name is Arwa Mahdawi, uh, 
or as Guido Fawkes called me, the Army's Looney Left Lecturer, which I think has a, a very nice ring to it. Um, and it's funny because, you know, when you talk about diversity in the workforce, when you talk about gender equality or women in leadership, you sometimes do get that sort of like knee jerk reaction of people going, oh, I'm going to get lectured. I'm going to hear talk about diversity with, you know, multicolored hands in the air, you know, people of all races with their hands up, holding each other, giving each other high fives, holding the globe up. When we talk about diversity and women in the workforce, we often tend to do so in a really stock standard, unimaginative kind of way. And that's because really a lot of us don't want to talk about diversity. For a lot of companies, for a lot of organizations, it is sometimes, unfortunately, not something they really want to do. It's just a problem that needs to be fixed because, you know, over the past 20 years, we've all seen lawsuits after lawsuits. We've all seen the sort of bad PR and all of the problems that come with not actually fixing diversity and fixing women and, and fixing gender equality in the workforce. You know, and as um, previous speakers have said, the world is changing. You know, you have to evolve or you'll go extinct. The world now looks very differently than it did 50 years ago. Britain looks very differently than it did 50 years ago. And if your organizations don't uh, evolve to change that, you will be left behind. You know, the faces of our cities, of our countryside, that has changed. But what hasn't changed really still is the faces of people in power. You know, we still face institutional sexism. Uh, there was this stat a few years ago in America that um, there were more men called John leading major companies than women leading major companies. Now that's changed a little bit, um, but you know, there's still a massive gap between um, the number of men in charge and the number of women. And we still face institutional sexism. It's been well established uh, in America, but there's studies across the world with, with similar findings that, you know, if you have a typically uh, a white name, you're much more likely to be called back for an interview than in this case, if you have a more typically African-American name, you're almost double as likely to get called back for an interview. And the fact that we still face this institutional sexism, this institutional racism, the, the fact that there's still this real kind of resistance to actually oper uh, operationalizing diversity and gender equality, is so infuriating because study after study shows the diversity and gender equality is not just about political correctness. You know, it's not, it, it is a moral obligation, but it's more than that. It is, you know, as the speakers before we're talking about, it's about operational effectiveness. And this uh, one study, for example, showed that when you, you have a 41% revenue gain, and this is in a corporate environment, when you go from a single sex team to one with equal gender representation. I'm talking equal gender representation here. I'm not saying an all women team is better than an all men team. I'm saying that what you need is diversity of ideas. You need, you need to be recruiting from across you know, the entire uh, human race, not just 50% of the population. And another study from McKinsey this time found that racially diverse teams outperform non-diverse ones by 35%. And again, this goes to themes that we were talking about earlier today that, you know, heterogeneity breeds better ideas. It breeds better, better operational effectiveness than just like homogenous views, homogenous people. And companies with inclusive talent practices can generate up to 30% higher revenue per employee. And again, this, is, this goes to, you know, again, picking from the best of the talent rather than just picking from a very, very narrow talent pool. So here's the situation, basically. We, you know, companies know, com companies have been talking about diversity, about gender equality for so long now. It's been such a hot topic of conversation for so, so long. And yet, you know, we're still seeing a very glacial pace of change. So what do we do about this? How do we go from actually talking about diversity and gender equality to actually making it happen? So that's something I've been thinking about for a very long time. And a few years ago, I had this sort of brilliant idea. Uh, I, I realized like, this is how we're just gonna solve gender equality. This is how we're gonna solve diversity in the workplace for once and for all. So I got a group of people together. We started working on this new company. Um, 
And, you know, I think we really nailed it. So what is this new company? I'm sure you're all dying to know. It's called Rent a Minority. I like to think of it as a sort of Uber for diversity. It's diversity on demand because actually changing, actually making your culture more inclusive, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort. And often, you know, companies don't really have time for that. So this offers you diversity on demand. So how does it work? Well, if you're a minority, if you're a woman, you can sign up on the website. Um, we have had a lot of people sign up. We've got a, a long list of different featured minorities, ethnically ambiguous, cheerful women of color, smiling Muslim, Muslim woman, certified not to support ISIS or your money back, intellectual black guy. Really, we have a minority for every occasion. And uh, our clients have been very, very happy with us. Uh, you can see a long testimonial section on our website. And in fact, things have been going so well that we are starting a ad campaign um, next year, uh, kicking off in New York. So there may be a few people on here who are going, what on earth? Why on earth did the Center for Army Leadership invite this, <laughs> this person to speak? Is this a joke? And I get this question a lot. And um, I actually even put up a frequently asked questions page on the website to address this. And the, the answer is yes, this is a joke. <laughs> but the funny, you know, I, I set up Rent a Minority a few years ago uh, as a piece of satire. But the thing is, a lot of people didn't think it was a joke. I had in the first week, a thousand people sign up to be minorities. I think I could have made actually a lot of money if I had, you know, <laughs> put it on, uh, if I made it a real business. And, you know, what I was trying to satirize with Rent a Minority was the way a lot of companies and organizations approach diversity and approach gender equality. A lot of organizations, they don't, they don't really want to solve it. They don't really want to take the time and energy to solve it. It's just a defense mechanism for them. They want to tick a few boxes so that they don't get the bad PR. You know, what's missing is this genuine sense that diversity and gender equality helps operational efficiency, is good for the bottom line, is more than political correctness. You know, there is a belief gap. People talk about it, but a lot of people still don't actually genuinely believe it. And, you know, it, it is so important to address that elephant in the room because, you know, this sort of like half-hearted attempt to deal with diversity and gender equality has actually really made things worse in a way. There's this Harvard Business Review study that found that a lot of the most um, popular diversity initiatives have actually backfired. Um, instead of making companies more diverse, more equal, they've made them less equal. And, and why is that? That's because basically people often respond to compulsory diversity courses with anger and resistance. And many participants actually report more animosity towards other groups afterwards. And that's something, you know, I've come across in my working life um, personally, because, you know, I don't want to boast or anything, but I am in what people, in technical terms, you might call a threefer. I'm brown, I'm gay, I'm female, I'm three minorities for the price of one. And, you know, it is so funny how many people seem to think that that gives me an advantage in the world now. You know, I've had people sort of say to my face in different in different circumstances, oh, you know, it must be so great now being a woman, being brown, like, you know, affirm basically kind of whispering, oh, affirmative action, like, you only got that job because you're a woman, you only got this because you're a diversity hire. Like, I literally had people say to my face, oh, you're a diversity hire. And, you know, the our approach to, <laughs> that is so obviously patently false as, you know, the, the slides on institutional sexism, institutional racism right now <laughs> demonstrate. I mean, you just have to look around at the world. The world is not being led by mixed race lesbians. <laughs> you know, it is not. Uh, so the, we still face a lot of, um, of barriers. And... <laughs> But, but then there's this sort of double bind because every time you do get a win, every time you get a promotion or something, people are very quick to, to boil it down to diversity. So, you know, for me, I've, I found rent a minority for me was kind of an expression of this frustration that we've just been talking about diversity, gender equality so much. We've really been going at it the wrong way, you know, a lot of the time. So the big question, I guess, is like, 
where do we go from here? Rent a minority was a fake solution to a very real problem. What is the real solution? So I, you know, one of the big takeaways I want you to kind of leave with from this speech is that we really need to reframe how we think about diversity and inclusion. We need to reframe how we think about gender equality because, you know, that whole Guido Fawkes, like that kick, you know, knee jerk reaction to just like, I don't want to hear about this. It, it, it is that elephant, it is that barrier to getting anything done. And I think, you know, I found that rent minority was a really um, interesting, like it was well received by a lot of people because you don't find much humor around the area of leadership and or diversity, inclusion and gender equality. It can be very dry and it can sort of like, it can, people sometimes get in defensive mode. And, and I think that laughter, even though, you know, a lot of this is not funny at all, like you, you can, humor is a really interesting way of reframing an issue and getting people to see things in a slightly different way. And you know, I when you if you Google image diversity or like women in the workforce, you get like this sort of thing. You get it's just like very much like kumbaya, like political correctness, just pastels. And this doesn't scream business to you, does it? It doesn't scream operational effectiveness. And I think it is so important. One thing I always say to companies, like we need to go from thinking about diversity and gender equality as this sort of like political correct thing. We need to start thinking about it the way that people were thinking about digital transformation 10, 15 years ago. People knew that the world was getting more digital and that if you didn't evolve, you're going to go extinct. And it is the same with diversity and gender equality. If you're not tapping in to, you know, all, all the talent that you represent, then, you know, you're not going to be uh, performing at your best. If you're not, if your organization looks extremely different to the people it's meant to be serving, then are you really performing at your best? No. So we, I think we really need to think about diversity and inclusion in the same way that we thought about um, digital transformation. Another big point is reducing unconscious bias. Now, a lot of people, they get a bit defensive when you talk about unconscious bias. They're like, oh, I'm not sexist, I'm not homophobic, I'm not racist, etc." And I, I wanna start by making the point that like, everybody has unconscious bias, it's part of being human. We, as humans, we all, you know, we trust what's familiar. And, you know, I was, um, uh, back when I worked in advertising, I was looking through a big pile of CVs and, I realized that the person that I put at the top of the pile, she was um, mixed race at my same university doing the same degree I'd done. And I was like, oh my God, am I trying to, uh, you know, recruit a mini me? Um, and that was like my unconscious bias at work, just like being drawn to what is familiar. And every single person does that. And what's important is recognizing that and finding ways to mitigate that, finding ways to say, okay, how do I reduce that? And in every organization, unconscious bias creeps in, in in various ways. So, you know, women are 1.4 times more likely to receive critical subjective feedback in evaluation studies have found. And that's because, you know, a lot of the, the lot, a lot of the ways we grade men and women kind of tap into unconscious biases about what, what men are good at and what women are good at. And this is really fascinating study that was done in, in America uh, just quite recently. And it found that if you're rating women on a one to 10 point system, then they are significantly less um, likely to get tens than men because, because in our culture, we associate the number 10 with excellence. We associate the number 10 with brilliance. And we also associate men with brilliance. You know, <laughs> research has shown that um, girls as young as six years old associate brilliance, uh, the thing that brilliance is a male trait. You know, it is drummed into us from a very young age that men are brilliant and women are nice. Now, what's interesting is that if you switch from a one to six point scale, you eliminate the gender gap because six doesn't have that same association with brilliance. And so people are much more likely to give women sixes. And if you're wondering if, you know, the, uh, the women, in the six point were, were kind of different in each study. No, they, what, they, what the researchers did was they um, gave university students transcripts of a lecture, exactly the same lecture. One was from Joan Smith, one was from John Smith, and they had to grade uh, how good they thought it was. 
So again, it's, it's really an example of, of unconscious bias kicking in and this sort of cultural bias to think of men as brilliant and women as nice. And one way we can get around that as well is uh, of getting rid of this unconscious bias is instead of having like, you know, just, uh, you know, one performance review every year, et cetera, it's just finding ways to have continuous feedback loops and finding ways to create a culture where people speak up, people are listened to, people are heard. And that, that sounds so simple, but it's, it's really, a lot of companies find it very hard to do. Another big point I want to talk about, and this was brought up at the beginning of the day as well, was we need to eliminate diversity silos. Like, it's not one person's job to solve gender equality or to solve diversity in the workforce. You know, it's not HR's fault. It's not HR's problem. It's just HR's problem. It's not just like the CEO's problem. Everyone bears some responsibility. You know, everyone has a part to play in this. And again, this goes towards like diversity really, I, I, I don't kind of like the word, I think that, you know, you can even forget the word diversity and talk about building an inclusive culture. If you have a culture where people are empowered, feel empowered to speak up and if, where people feel like they're heard and valued, you will create a more diverse culture. And a thing that a lot of companies and organizations get wrong is that they really focus on recruitment rather than retainment. So. And you can see this with a lot of the big tech giants. They've spent a fortune on recruiting more women, more minorities. And then those women and minorities, they don't stay. You know, they, they leave very quickly because nothing in the culture has changed. It's much easier to throw money at recruitment than it is to create a culture where you retain a diverse group of talent. Um, another thing I think is really important is to avoid silver bullet syndrome. So there is no quick fix. And I talk to a lot of companies about gender equality and uh, diversity. And, you know, they all want me to give them like some kind of like, ah, oh, this is the secret. This is how we can just like solve it overnight. And obviously that doesn't exist. What is really important, again, is this idea that we're all personally responsible, we can all do something. And rather than focusing on one big change, we need to think about how micro actions result in macro changes. You know, sometimes like the scale of the problem can kind of blind you to doing anything about it. But we need to think, what is the low hanging fruit? How can, what, what can I as an individual do to, to kind of improve this culture? What three things I can do tomorrow? Everybody can do something. Everybody needs to bear responsibility. And the last big point is really, rethinking what a leader looks like. So I wrote a book uh, that came out five days ago, yeah, um, A Strong Female Lead, Lessons from Women in Power. And I've got to say, I do not know how Adrian wrote four books in one year because writing one book in a year almost killed me. So <laughs> props to Adrian. But so I, um, but I, I did come out of it alive and I wrote this book, Strong Female Lead, which my purpose with it is to reframe how we think about leadership because you know leadership is something we talk about so so much but it's you know it's not often that we stand back and we interrogate our biases about it we interrogate like what the trad traditional leadership model is and this is something that came up in adrian's talk as well that like our leadership model has traditionally been very male you know it ties into things of thinking that men are brilliant you know men are the big heroes uh, women are just nice. Um, and, you know, can, does anyone think that Elon Musk would be considered a genius if he was a woman? Like, absolutely not. He makes, you know, he makes jokes, like boob jokes on Twitter. He, he acts like a juvenile. He's, I mean, if a woman acted like that, she she would be laughed out of the room, but Elon Musk is sort of revered as this genius. And I, I think he's a really interesting example of, of, you know, our gendered notions of leadership. Would we, uh, you know, can you imagine a female Boris Johnson? Can you imagine a prime minister of this country, a female prime minister of this country who refuses to disclose how many children she's had by, you know, by how many um, partners? That would never happen. You know, we do have very uh, <laughs> double standards still and what we think is acceptable in men is not acceptable in women. Um, and I, th I think that the pandemic has given us a, 
has sort of caused a lot of us to rethink leadership and rethink what an effective leader looks like. And I don't know how familiar you all are with Andrew Cuomo. I'm based in New York normally, and I was in New York at the start of the pandemic. And Andrew Cuomo, who was then the governor of New York, he was treated as this sort of god at the beginning of the pandemic. You know, he gave these daily press briefings, which were very um, impressive. And he had this air of authority. And he was basically people's idea of what a leader looked like, sort of authoritarian, knows what's, what he's doing. OK, he's in charge. We're OK. And he won an Emmy for his daily press briefings. And it's very fitting that he won an Emmy because those briefings really were, were performance. You know, he was acting like a leader, but on the ground, he was not being effective at all. He was actually clashing with Mayor de Blasio, who's the, who's the mayor of New York. Their egos were clashing and they were like, and no decisions were being made because both, both of them wanted credit for it. So New York went into lockdown a lot later than it should have because basically Andrew Cuomo and de Blasio couldn't make up their minds and they couldn't cooperate. And now, of course, his star has come crashing down and everybody's realized he was terrible leader not just because of the sexual misconduct things but you know he he was writing a book during the pandemic when he was supposed to be uh actually leading um and, uh yeah not really what a leader is made of now the interesting thing is that women over the last you know couple of decades they've told been told that if you want to get ahead in the workplace you know you need to lean in you need to basically act like men and we've been told that, you know, women, we, women have been told that, okay, well, you've been socialized to be nice and to listen. All of those things are weaknesses. And if you want to get ahead, you have to act more like quote unquote a man and be more aggressive, assertive, speak up. Um, I don't know if any of you remember in 2012, there was this viral TED talk about power poses. Um, and it was basically stand up and make yourself big. And that makes you more confident. And that makes you a better leader. And Amy, Cud uh, this, this has been viewed like over 60 million times, uh, probably more now. But one of her things was, if you feel like you shouldn't be somewhere, fake it. Do, not, uh, do it not until you make it, but until you become it. And this whole fake it until you make it ethos has been really like, it's been like a big part of leadership uh, advice to women in the last 10 years basically this idea that you should just be confident act like you deserve it and sort of muscle your way to the top and that is such bad advice I mean when you look at Elizabeth Holmes who's currently on trial that's exactly what she did she faked it until she almost made it you know she made herself into this image of what we think a leader looks like and you know, I think that she's such an interesting figure because she really sort of tried to lean into a toxic style of leadership when really she should have been leaning out and focusing on a very different style of leadership, which in my book is, uh, I talk about as a more female style of leadership, that in today's world, you know, this old fashioned authoritarian style of leadership, this very traditionally sort of masculine uh, style of leadership really isn't fit for purpose anymore. All of the skills that women have in the past been told are weaknesses, you know, things like empathy, things like collaboration, things like listening are really strengths. And we should be moving from a masculine coded uh, style of leadership to a more female coded style of leadership. That doesn't mean that, you know, we need more women in positions of power for the sake of it. I'm not interested in women in positions of power for the sake of it. I don't care if we have more women in positions of power, if they just act like the men who came before them and if they, if they perpetuate a toxic style of leadership. I'm interested in a style of leadership that reflects the qualities that we tend to think of as more female. But as, as, um, uh, as was talked about before by Adrian, I also want to make the final point that we shouldn't rely on heroes. We are all leaders. You know, today's style of leadership isn't about individuals saving us. It's about everybody doing their part and having people at the top who manage to tap into collective intelligence and tap in to everybody's leadership ability. And I want to end with the final point that it is so important to interrogate our style of leadership. And, you know, it's so important that, uh, organizations like the Center for Army Leadership exist because we really can't change the world at all until we change our ideas about leadership. Thank you so much.
Oh, well, thank you. Uh, and I love the challenge uh, towards the start of your talk about not talking about change, but actually getting on and making it happen. And of course, I think we all recognize that none of us should be doing this because we're told to do it, but because we, we understand certainly within the military context that we will be better operationally and more effective. And for other organizations, it might be about attracting and broadening their customer base or remaining relevant to society. I also love the ideas of really understanding our own mindsets. So this is so much more than the physical diversity. I, for one, after 20 years as an army officer, could be guilty of evolving more to, towards my, my counterparts and other people who've been in the organization 20 years than keeping fresh, new, different ideas. So unless we continue to surround ourselves with people who think differently, have a broad and varying range of, of touch points with society from different backgrounds, different age ranges, we will become out of touch far too quickly and just start to become an echo chamber. So I just wonder for all of us, how do we remain relevant? Oh, well, thank you. Our final speaker this morning is Dr. Belissa Green. She's Assistant Head of Diversity and Inclusion in the British Army. Dr. Green is an award-winning occupational psychologist with over 15 years of leadership and policy development uh, experience in both large and small organizations. Delivering fairness, equality, transparency have all been the common threads throughout her career to date. She has worked diligently to support evidence-based programme delivery and delivers change through improving analytical capability, sound governments, and most importantly, inspiring others. Driven by an understanding of the need to shine a light on untold stories to influence change, she completed her PhD on the lived experience of Commonwealth personnel in the British Army. In her current role, she is passionate about solving real world problems through the use of research and evidence. Her interests include how diverse social and organizational identities affect working life and the experience of work. To close our morning session, Dr. Green will address an inclusive army culture. Um, so good morning, everyone. And as I said, thank you for the opportunity to share um, the work that has been done by so many um, in our organization to get us to a point where we can really look at um, objectively what drives our organizational culture and the implications for leadership and behavior as have been sort of touched upon by uh, sort of speakers um, this morning. So having listened to the speakers this morning, I would very much like to take you through how we um, in the organization uh, got to the journey we're on now um, with measuring our organizational culture in terms of how it became central, why we need to focus on inclusion and some of the factors that kind of put us here and that have um, been very, very critical in sort of getting us to think and understand kind of what culture means. What I'd also like to do is take a brief look at the sort of measurement and evaluation process. Um, it's a journey that we're on and to sort of talk through how we're moving from a sort of static look at culture and inclusion to one that is a bit more dynamic. And then finally, the role that leadership um, needs to play as um, uh, Professor Fernan reminded us this morning, sort of, you know, leadership creates, leaders create cultures and look at how, um, you know, the role of leadership um, sort of acts in sort of driving that inclusive culture forward. So inclusion is the cornerstone of all of our sort of people transformation sort of programs from everything from recruitment and development to career progression, how we think about uh, sort of our career pathways, what are the terms and conditions of service, and even sort of health and well-being. You know, we're looking at all of these things in the sort of personal arena with a cultural lens, and we have to do that. What does it mean for us in this organization to talk about inclusion? You know, we talk about um, us being one team, that we're all part of the same team. And so we really have to think about not only what does that mean, but also what is the outcome? And for, in terms of looking at the personnel world, um, ultimately we're trying to get to um, a place where the organization is competitive, adaptable, 
and it's inclusive. Okay, and we kind of need to do that um, in order to get to a place where um, we're delivering operational effectiveness. So where are we with inclusion? We talk about a lot of concepts in the army which feel like inclusion. So the army sergeant major um, this morning talked about loyalty as one of those. We talk about belonging, we talk about teamwork, we talk about cohesion, but what does inclusion really mean? And why is it important for our organization? And because what we are seeking to do is really to reestablish and reshape our organizational culture, one that is built on trust, psychological safety to challenge, could be that was talked about this morning as well, and kind of where all team members are valued for who they are and what they bring to the team, we need to think and understand kind of where are we with inclusion and what do we really mean by that? So what I'd like to do is a little bit of a, 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 an exercise and like you just to kind of reflect on this um, with me, if you'd kind of indulge me. So this model of inclusion focuses on the need to value individuals for their uniqueness, because we talk a lot about that in our organization. People come into our organization, they come into the army um, for transformation, for self-development, for a career, and they bring with them sort of unique experiences and identities. We also recruit internationally, we recruit from, you know, we recruit from disparate parts of, of the country as well. So in terms of this model of inclusion, which is why I like so much, it looks at uniqueness. You know, how do we value uniqueness? So is uniqueness highly valued or is it, or is it not valued very much at all? And then belongingness, because we talk about belonging in our organization. You know, where do you belong in this organization if you are unique or if you are different? So before I go further, I would ask you to sort of, if you are in the army, would you be able to pop into the chat where you think the army is on this? Um, so if you could sort of, so if there's a poll, would you be able to uh, sort of pop your answers in? And if you're not in the army, um, could you also just sort of think about um, what's your perception of in, where we are with inclusion? How do we treat people in, in the organization. So we'll come back uh, to the views later, uh, but it's worth holding on to what we say we want to talk about the, in terms of inclusion, what inclusion really is, and also where we are. So I'll just give you a minute to sort of read that and um, sort of do the poll if that's okay. Okay, I'll be interesting to go back to those. Right, so how do we get or how did we rather get to a position where we needed to reflect on the effectiveness of our culture? And over the last three years or so, the army has been, I suppose, compelled to consider its organizational culture. The Wigston report into inappropriate behaviors, not just for the army, but across defense, really put into sharp focus that there needs to be a, a look and evaluation at the culture of the organization. And it identified our culture as really the vehicle, I suppose, that drove unacceptable behaviors. And that led to isolation and a lack of team cohesion with different members of our sort of wider army team being treated differently. Additionally, following on from the impact you know, of, of that, um, report, 
there was a gray report one year on which really sort of consolidated some of those issues and you know the kind of social movements of the summer of 2010 not least um sort of the black lives matter movement and me to really got us as an organization reflecting on where are we in this conversation where are we with um, how our people are treated where are we with inclusion and what does our sort of culture look like so the executive committee of the army board ecab made a commitment to ensure that the army is an organization which is justifiably recognized as an employer of choice where everyone can bring their whole self to work and where we can ultimately challenge unacceptable behavior so the focus on organizational culture to deliver that was critical and also looking at sort of leadership the implications of leadership on how that culture and how the behaviors in the organization are enacted was something that um, we we were forced to do during this time so what do we mean by culture within the army we use the term a lot but again, within the army, there are lots of different ways of thinking about culture. So we have military culture, you know, what does, and that's broader than us, broader than, than the army. It's sort of across defense, but what does it mean to be in the military? What's that culture like? Then we have sort of unit culture at the sort of more team level and some more day-to-day -day level. You know, we, we, we do that and we measure that and we think about that. Then we have army culture. What is it like to be in this organization? In terms of the army we also talk about sort of head office culture army headquarters if you work in a headquarters environment there's a different kind of culture there and then we look at individual behaviors and sometimes we talk about culture when we're really talking about uh, behaviors and undoubtedly a series of behaviors and a collector a collection of behaviors really does sort of um have implications for the culture that that uh, we have in the organization so in order to sort of do that, in order to define really what culture meant for the organization, we decided to identify what good looks like. What does culture look like? So I'd just like to take a quick moment to talk you through this, this, this slide. It looks fairly busy, but I hope it's sort of straightforward. Um, we decided to identify what culture meant and identify not only what good looked like, but what the components of culture were that we would measure and uh, value. So in terms of what good looks like, it's an inclusive values-based army where all elements of the whole force share and live by a strong moral compass anchored on the army's values and standards and the civil service code so that they do the right things and act as role models and inspire others to be the best to deliver operational capability. And we'll come back to this operational capability because that is ultimately what inclusion and an, an inclusive culture um, delivers. It delivers operational capability and operational effectiveness. So there are six themes against which we would measure the sort of organizational culture and by organizational culture for this particular piece of work we were really talking about unit culture we decided to focus on measuring the culture of a unit because if we are doing that consistently across the organization then we're definitely going to get a picture for what the culture the overall culture of the organization um, sort of looked and felt like and i think we talked about this sort of this was talking about earlier sort of leadership drives performance which ultimately sort of drives the culture. So that's why culture is sort of central to um, those themes. And we identify that it must be embedded, absolutely embedded in policy across the organization and adopted comprehensively. So looking at the values and standards, making sure that people not only understood them, but lived by them, ownership of those values and standards, a challenge culture where people are able to feel safe enough to call out unacceptable behaviors, inappropriate behaviors, challenge leaders. And as you know, was talked about this morning, there is a time and there's a place for challenge, but we, we are building that into um, how we work so that we are continually learning and getting the right, getting to the right decisions. In terms of inclusiveness, you know, that drives all of 
the uh, sort of factors that we sort of talked about. So this is the framework for organizational culture that is driving how we go about the practical delivery of getting organizational culture to change in our organization. So how did we do that? So time was taken, so this was done with a multidisciplinary team from the workforce policy um, area, our sort of research team, our occupational psychologists in the Army Personnel Research Center um, to really think about how would we develop a process where we could actually measure uh, and develop um, organizational culture. So we had an existing climate assessment. So a climate assessment is where we sort of measure the climate of a unit, where we would go in and ensure that um, leadership and behaviors were where they needed to be. Um, in the previous model um, of a sort of climate assessment, there was a focus on very specific leadership behaviors, particularly around bullying, harassment and discrimination and sort of alcohol and drugs. But when we looked at that and we sort of developed the uh, sort of framework that I uh, sort of showed in the previous slide, we, there was an understanding that culture was broader than those things, absolutely broader than those things. And so we wanted to incorporate, incorporate those things. So developing the climate assessment to include leadership ownership, challenge, inclusiveness, continu continual learning across three domains of predominantly inappropriate behaviors, safety and security, we developed a maturity model. So this is gonna tell us how do we not only measure organizational culture, but how do we mature culture through the unit? How do we get from point A to point B? And then there would be a workbook for the leaders to be able to move through and the difference between this and what we this model and what we had done or what we had previously was there hadn't necessarily been a way to help leaders progress from where they were to where they needed to be so this was all about maturing culture over time this was not about a single snapshot this was not about blame this is not about sort of saying to individuals that, you know, this is the culture of your organization. It's been measured. You need to do better. Well, the question was how? How would we help and develop people to do better? Because if we were going to do that, if we were going to develop our leaders, if we're going to help them to move forward with changing the culture of their organization, we would have a better success rate. And that's what all the data showed, that's what all the literature showed, which is why there was a sort of a, a move to, to doing that. So the, we were kind of transitioning from a tool to measuring culture to a tool to improving and developing culture, moving from a sort of passive to a, a sort of active way of thinking about culture. So how, what does this look like? What does this sort of um, moving from a static view to a sort of uh, progressive view look like? So across the dimensions, all the dimensions that we identified sort of, uh, sort of encompassed broader organizational culture, we identified that there were levels. There were levels that you could, um, that, that you could achieve, that, that you would be at. And not every unit and not every sort of leader uh, was at the same level. And so we understood so level one was very much a sort of baseline level. This was where you kind of had the awareness uh, level where you might not have necessarily modeled the right behaviors that wasn't necessarily modeled in units and where there might have been an awareness of kind of what to do but not necessarily um, any ownership um, of that. And particularly around the challenge sort of uh, sort of function, but maybe people feeling uncomfortable challenging. And there was definitely some of that. And we wanted to be able to move people from level one to level three, where this was a sort of living, breathing example of you know, how organizational culture looked, what good looks like, and where people would be taking responsibility for their actions. And they were valuing diversity as an asset. So as I mentioned before, the original process 
um, was a sort of snapshot and we move more towards a sort of roadmap sort of version of this where we were sort of changing and progressing towards. And originally, um, if you did a sort of climate assessment and you came out at a level one, for example, this was very much left to the discretion of the leadership um, to figure out um, how you would move from where you were to where you needed to be. And that was that wasn't necessarily the, the, the most effective way to do that. So we identified that, issue, as I said before, sort of enabling leaders to sort of um, have the tools to do that and the support to do that would be much more effective. And so I think for our organization, the importance of the results of the climate assessment process are, is really just the first step. It's the journey on, you know, what tools do you now need, depending on what has sort of come about, what tools do you now need to sort of move forward? So I hear you say that's all well and good in theory, but what are some of the practical barriers um, to delivering that? Okay, so we, um, uh, Professor Furnham talked this morning about sort of, sort of person that being personality driven, and that is absolutely true and that's been identified. Um, with any model that involves a change in behavior, um, there are some risks to delivery and personality um, is, is, is one of those, which is why we've sort of identified um, the accountability element and that it just can't be personality driven. This is now going to have to be done by all leaders of the organization if you are sort of um, in charge of a unit. Uh, you have to this has to be done and you and once everybody is doing it it certain, certainly and suddenly becomes the thing that everybody is doing and developing the sort of community of practice and i was sort of talked about um not just one person being responsible um, for culture but it being the responsibility of everyone but in our organization we definitely need to hold leaders to account and that's built into the process understanding the data is uh, has was identified as a potential barrier um, and which is why we moved to having very um, clear sort of descriptors of what's required and also just thinking through kind of who needs the data, who can see the data, who has access to it and what does the data actually tell us. Okay, so it has to be in a way that is understandable to our leaders. So in terms of the resources to support development, we have developed uh, a toolkit. So once you have taken the sort of cultural um, sort of assessment, the climate assessment of your unit, and depending on what, what there is, there are resources and tools to sort of help individuals do that. And that's part and parcel of the process. And then I think one of the things that we've identified as a potential barrier was this kind of posting cycle. People move every sort of two to three years, and then potentially that can be um, a problem to uh, sort of progression, but we feature that in by giving timelines for developing models. So even if an individual themselves have sort of moved on, then there is a plan in place where that everybody can sort of have access to um, that will tell us how we can move uh, the sort of climate of, of the organization. So definitely um, there were some potential barriers which we have sort of factored in. So Alma mentioned as, as well in her sort of uh, talk before my organizational learning, this bit about sort of being inclusive. How do we learn as an organization? And thinking about what we do with the data um, was critical in developing a sort of inclusive sort of cultural assessment. We needed to just not just ask people to, to do these assessments and then sort of here's a plan and off you go. We need as the organization, as the army to look at that data. And there are plans for us to collect that data, store it centrally, so that we are able to get snapshots of what are some of the key issues in the organization. And then what were some of the things that we needed to do to be able to resolve those, certainly at policy level. You know, what were some of the things that were sort of um, not sort of necessarily going the way they needed to go. So there are annual reports. We need to think about who needed to use them, what they would look like. How, how you know how they could be useful and using in terms of that decision making using that to refine not only the model but the strategy the personal strategy it's not just 
here's something, here's a report, isn't that great? And then this whole question of um, accountability really was one that came up. And we decided that, you know, we cannot have organizational learning if there is anonymity. So that is not to say that there is sort of persecution, that's not to say that people um, would, would not be held account. This is just saying we're moving away from being sort of completely anonymous to sort of a top level where um, certain data could be shared with people um, who are in your chain of command that would make us think through how we wanted to move forward. So that's definitely something that we thought through in terms of organizational learning. So just sort of going back to um, the, the, the sort of poll that I've kind of uh, uh, asked uh, you to sort of think about earlier on, just thinking about sort of inclusive culture and what kind of inclusion meant for our organization. There are some guiding principles for this organization. And in terms of the two guiding principles and how to move forward with culture improvements, I think without ensuring that we absolutely build this in a way to identify and model inclusive behaviors, our culture really doesn't change. It remains as it always has, and we perpetuate systems of inequality, which is why celebrating our diversity and embedding inclusive behavior into not only our culture, but everything that we do, make sure that there is an evolution and it becomes sort of future proof. We talked about sort of the generational shift, of people joining our organization. You know, when we have um, when we have that process as sort of standard, you know, it becomes part of the organizational culture that this is something that we do, something that we 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 sort of think through. And the second principle, the second guiding principle is about challenging unacceptable behavior um, and behavior that is counter to, to sort of our sort of teamwork ethos it's about breaking down barriers and obstacles that prevent people from uh, giving of their best and feeling like they are not able to uh, sort of come and be part of this organization and bring their sort of whole self and so i think that's an important reflection on all of us uh, when people don't feel included i mean they don't develop psychological safety as i talked about before and they don't feel able to sort of um, challenge and contribute to a positive working environment that delivers organizational effectiveness and that is really we, where we need to be with thinking through organizational culture and inclusion it is about robust organizational effectiveness so in summary this is a journey it's a journey and we need to think through how we um, how we sort of progress with that and we're on the foothills of that journey and just sort of thinking through and just sort of looking at the, the, the poll um, that I can see on my screen here I think what we're saying at the moment is we have a way to go on that journey for people to feel truly included it seems like we're better at a sort of assimilation which is where we value difference but you kind of need to 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 put that aside a little bit and get on with what we're doing in this organization and there is a place for that there's absolutely a place for that when we're talking about um, making sure that people really feel that they are a part of this organization for what they for what they bring um, we definitely have some way uh, to sort of go on that and inclusion for us is about psychological safety and operational effectiveness as i've said before and I'd just like to say, in order for us to sort of develop that culture, we have to take an evidence-based approach and not sort of latch on to the next um, sort of sort of good ideas. I mean, if good ideas are bound in sort of evidence uh, that support and develop uh, where we're trying to go, then that is absolutely where we need to be. So thank you very much for having me. Um, I think I've just run over slightly, but. Um, more than happy to take questions at the appropriate time. Thank you. Dr. Belissa, thank you so much. And I think, you know, that point at the end there about the journey that we're on and we're in the foothills. Um, but I think the good news is, is that we as an organization are 
having that conversation in the first instance and doing so in a very open and transparent way. And I would love to encourage any of you who are not from within uh, the military organization to, to tell us where you're seeing success in your own organizations in some of these areas and do share that in some of the chat uh, if you've got particular examples uh, that are worthy of, of sort of joining to the conversation. We're now going to take a, a break uh, in order for those of you who've been with us all morning just to have a leg stretch and a comfort break and then we're going to come back for some questions and uh, a team have been looking at all the questions uh, filtering them and everything and then we're going to uh, go after probably about five or six depending on a time availability so so can i encourage you to take a, a few minutes to go and have that leg stretch uh, if we come back in in about five minutes and then we will be set up ready for the questions and answers thank you Uh, well, welcome back. We're now going to have a question and answer session, uh, which has been taken predominantly from the Slido questions and a little bit from some of the chat as well uh, that you've been contributing to throughout this morning's sessions. And thank you for being so active and engaged in it. So the first question, which I'm going to uh, pose to Professor Adrian in the first instance for really the sort of academic view, uh, Dr. Belissa for the sort of policy view from a, an organizational perspective, and then to the Army Sergeant Major, uh, is, is to do with challenging culture. And I think uh, particularly in an organization where we are so clearly hierarchical, hierarchical and uh, you know, bottom fed, one of the questions is linked to providing a culture where it is safe to speak out without fear of reprisal. Um, but if I extend that further, that if we are to be a growing and learning organization, um, it needs to be one where those who may get it wrong have an opportunity to learn from those mistakes as well. And really linking into any training requirement and the realities of the different methods that may be available and, and seem to be best practice. So, Professor Adrian, if I can go to you first, please, uh, for a view. Oh, to answer those questions. Gosh, that's a big question. Um, oh, I don't know where to begin. Let me say, I think a few things about culture. The first is, I think insiders have no idea about the culture. The longer you've been in the military, the less you know about your culture. It's true of all organisations. It's when you go from one to another, you get a tremendous shock um because it's you know it, you it, because you're confronted by it being different you're used to things happening my experience of going to the military as an outsider remember and as an academic the things that strike me immediately are people are extremely polite and respectful i've noticed that things are very orderly there's a sort of hint of ocd everywhere of this sort of following having the rules and so forth i notice i notice an intolerance of ambiguity. It's a very interesting one, a, a, very, a, a great concern about planfulness and making things certain. And of course, the, the world isn't like that in many ways, that you know, the world is uncertain and unclear. And the, the, the strong need to make things so planful might be, I think, not entirely uh, uh, um, adaptive. Um, I think, there's a work hard, play hard, which I, uh, I, I noticed. Let me say two, two more things um, in answer to those, those very big questions. The, the issue about speaking out. Well, first of all, you know, I come from a university. There's no chance of speaking out there in, in, in well, the issue is, my guess is that, that the, the military is based on a Weberian principle, span of control. That's where you get your hierarchies from. One person is in control of a certain size unit. So you have corporals and sergeants and lieutenants and so forth, and they all are with different units. Now, I think within your unit, what, how big it is, that there's probably a lot of opportunity to express your views um, and your concerns and your worries. Uh, and your and your weaknesses, and uh, you, you've seen this happen. The question is taking it higher up, and how how people can express their concerns, their worries, their doubts, and all those things. How those goes up the organisation. My experience is one can share this comfortably, openly, regularly, empathically with people at, in your team, whatever level you are. But how that goes up is not clear and what the mechanism is 
for that to go up the organization. That would be one observation I, I would have. Um, let me leave it there and you can come back to me with, with any other further questions. Have I not answered anything specific? I'll answer specifically if that helps. Thanks, Professor Adrian. Well, what we'll do is we'll use that as a link then to Dr. Belissa. So Dr. Belissa, on the basis that, that uh, Professor Adrian believes we do have plenty of mechanisms for, for sort of reporting and, and challenging, um, do you think that is the case? And do you think uh, we've created a safe space to do this? Um, to, and how are we getting it to the top of the organisation? Absolutely, I think those are some really valid points. And um, certainly, uh, I, I think there are a couple of key issues just to kind of raise. I think when we talk about sort of this organisation, yes, it's hierarchical, it is power driven, it's very highly structured. And if I am comfortable enough to sort of you know, challenge the question is, yes, how does it get back to the top? How does it, so how do we develop that sort of continual learning process? You know, how do we use our data? How do we use all this information? But certainly we have mechanisms by which people can speak out um, if they do not want to, if they didn't want to do so sort of directly, if they didn't feel psychologically safe to do that. You know, through our sort of speak out helpline, which is um, very well received. Um, there is a sort of defense helpline that has sort of been launched recently that is um, sort of growing um, in youth. And then there is the actual, the skill, how do I speak out? You know, how do I speak out when um, I may not be feeling confident? So in terms of a sort of, as organizationally, we have produced some training around how to do that. Uh, sort of, it's called sort of active bystander training. You know, because you may not want to sort of tackle things on directly because for that very same reason, that sort of fear of reprisal, but how do you distract someone? You know, how do you sort of stand up for someone without necessarily putting yourself um, in, in that position? Um, to sort of have reprisals you know how do you sort of maybe delay it sort of come back and deal with it later you know for people who are more confident to do it directly you know how do you do this directly so that everybody knows where you stand i think one of the observations and the trends that we're seeing across our sort of um surveys our sort of attitude surveys and, and things like that is that there is a growing um feeling amongst respondents that uh, the organization that people feel more so that leaders are taking complaints seriously so that's that's an improving trend that we're seeing and sort of really speaks to this journey that we're on because certainly i think we have a way to go but i think if people are feeding that back then i think that's we're, we're kind of on to a, a, a better we're kind of moving in a sort of better place so i would sort of say specifically in response to that, it's all of our responsibility to create psychological safety for good. It's really how safe do you feel as a leader? If you are a leader, how safe do you feel challenging unacceptable behaviors? So if you are a one star, think of your two star, your three star, your four star, how safe do you feel to raise those things? So, you know, how do people who you are leading feel? to um challenge things so it's down to all of us especially those in leadership positions to create the environment and the culture within which people feel safe enough um, to speak up and speak out george Belissa, thank you i'm going to turn now to the army sergeant major so so linking all of that together do you think in reality if you are a junior member of our organization currently that they recognize those points and think that we are changing and creating those opportunities and spaces to challenge some of this uh, poor culture so uh, i think taking off of uh, from dr belissa it's it's that uh, sense of being able to build confidence in people seeing what uh, results from when they do challenge and we still have this perception that when we do um, something bad's going to come from that challenge as, as opposed to some good from it. So I think there's an element of uh, our commanders, firstly, if they want to establish the ability for people to challenge is to demonstrate their own times when they've been challenged. Certainly myself uh, in previous roles, I've made it very clear when people of all ranks have, have come to me with challenge, either on my personal character or in the unit that I work in and talk them through what I went through and the stories I went through. We, uh, we do work in multiple groups, as, as Adrian spoke about beforehand, and, and we should take advantage of those groups. If, if a young soldier talks to their Lance Corporal, that creates and then embeds something that the Lance Corporal feels he can talk to the Corporal and sew up 
on that chain of command. So I think we, we need to build confidence in our teams. We expect to do it on operations. If they're on operations, they see something that may be a risk, we encourage our soldiers to call it out. So in the same sense, we turn that round to how we live our day-to-day -day lives. And we ask those soldiers and our people when they see something wrong, that they call it out. And we reward that. I think it's important that we reward it and acknowledge it. And it's only when people start to see those actions being rewarded that we will see more and more people come forward and feel confident to do so. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to move on now uh, to a question which I will... Uh, Opposed to, opposed to Awa and uh, Colonel Rob, which is about changing culture. And, and there are a few questions that have been uh, given to us, which are really about how we change an organization that's already institutionalized. Are we lurching too far in a direction of being woke, which is one of the sort of trend words clearly, uh, or is there such thing as going too far? Should we be pushing to the point of discomfort and beyond? Um, and is this just about leadership or is there something more that we may be missing? So Arva, could I come to you first really about, you know, changing culture and, and, and you know, can we do it as an institutionalized, as an institution such as ourselves? Mm -hmm. no, well, that kind of goes to the previous question is about people feeling safe about speaking up and more importantly, people feeling like they're being listened to. Um, I'll just give you an example from, I was, my start of my career uh, in a corporate law firm, I was a trainee solicitor, it was a very hierarchical organization where, you know, as a trainee, you did not feel like you could speak up about the partners. Um, and I heard through the, the grapevine, a partner making homophobic remarks about me. And just because I knew I was going to leave anyway, and I had nothing to lose, I went to HR and complained about it. And they were like, oh, yeah, well, you know, we know that about this guy, he's kind of a dinosaur. Uh, and I never heard anything back. So, and and that really fed into my decision to leave the company because you need to, you know, a company can't change completely overnight, but you, what you can do is you can start listening to people and you can start acknowledging people. You can make people feel heard. It doesn't matter who you are, people need to feel heard. And, you know, this partner in every single organization, there are a few bad apples, people who aren't going to ever change and people who often quite um, influence the culture uh, disproportionately. And I think a lot of companies need to be better about being brave about getting rid of those bad apples. It's almost it's like, well, you know, he's a very high performing partner. You know, we can't lose him no matter what he does. But what are you losing because of all the people who don't want to work with him or all the people who feel like they have no space because of the sort of culture that that person has created so often there is that hard truth that just a few people disproportionately affect a culture and if you're keeping them on you're saying that they're more valuable than the people that they're making you know feel excluded so and again it goes back to my um to my presentation that nothing can change overnight but you need the will to to change and things change through very small actions and it all starts by having these feedback loops and have making people feel heard just again just and there's nothing woke about that that's just general politeness that's just general kindness civility nothing woke about listening to people uh, so yeah that's my uh oh well, thank you and so if we take that uh rob to you and you know particularly where you're doing some of the, the grassroots training here at the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst. Uh, a view from you, please. Sure, so I think my, my view would be particularly uh, informed from my time uh, in the field army in, in leadership positions is that the, the leader has can make a real profound difference here. Mm. Um, and you know, I agree that you can't change organizations overnight, and certainly not on an, on, on an enduring basis, but I think particularly my observation of military teams is that they are they can change quite quickly uh, in response to a real clear steer from the leader uh, in terms of uh, what the leader prioritizes, uh, how they act, how they behave, uh, and that can permeate across the uh, military organization uh, quite quickly. I think we have quite a desire to, uh, to conform, in a sense, to conform with, with the, the behaviors being displayed by the leadership. So I think that that's a positive, and it's certainly one which I would want to kind of uh, instill in our leaders as we train them here is that they that their role in in their future the culture of their organizations is is, is really personal and, and it's really profound i think we shouldn't worry about uh we shouldn't worry about going too far uh 
the challenge is going far enough and fast enough. And I think there's, there's something about being deliberate about uh, what we're trying to do, particularly in a particular unit, for example, saying this is where we want to go, uh, have, identify some tangible changes that can begin the momentum, which then over time can, can, uh, can snowball and can turn into the more enduring change that will, will uh, last beyond you know, a particular time of a, of, a, of a certain commander. Brilliant, thank you. Um, for those of you who, who don't know much about our organisation, we have um, some mandated objectives that appear on both uh, uh, soldiers and officers reports, and one of those is, is a diversity objective. Um, the question that's been posed is, is actually, do we actually fulfil it and target against it, or is it just uh, really for show? Um, and how do we measure it? So, um, Army Sant Major, I'd like to come to you first, and then Dr. Melissa, I'd be interested for a sort of a sort of organisational view from your perspective, and then Arwa, just any experience you've had across different organisations of where people are trying to enforce some of this for the right reasons, but might not necessarily have recognised or identified the right mechanism to do so. So what made you first? So I, I think the objective was a, a good idea, but was poorly executed. We, um, we knew we needed to do something about it, and by creating a push to have a mandated objective, was a way of putting that on personnel as a responsibility. Where we uh, fell, failed in the execution was we turned it into a, a cut and paste objective, which actually isn't part of the policy. You can, uh, you can agree as before. And so rather than put a cut and paste statement into someone's objective and hope that they, they meet it, we go back to how we do our reports properly. We set an objective that is timely and specific to us. So for a young soldier, that may be attending some DNI training within in the year. But for someone a bit more senior, that may be developing that training. That may be creating an awareness day. That might be um, uh, implementing a, a mentoring program with uh, other members of minority groups. So I think it was the execution that was, was the issue. I think the uh, objective, like all our other objectives, should have been made measurable and should have been made personal to the person doing it. I would love to get to the point where we don't need it to be mandated and it's uh, uh, just a way of life that we get on and deliver the deliver and understand DNI within our units. And I think, you know, just tying into the first point that we and question that we addressed about challenging culture, it's about uh, as individuals understanding what mechanisms we've put pl in place individually to make sure we can actually meet those challenge, yes. challenges. I mean, I look back on some of the earlier parts of my career and I'm mortified looking back at some of the decisions I made and that nobody called me out on them. And because my own personal circumstances have changed throughout my career, I now see that they were probably ill-informed decisions, but I was more bothered about looking back that no one had either felt they could or would come forward and challenge. So it is about setting those conditions in the first place. Um, Dr. Melissa, what about from your organisational view from, from sort of the Army headquarters? Yeah, so I think, you know, as part of, you know, I, I would say sort of just as looking at sort of comments that sort are of popping up as well, just, just thinking through that sort of that delivery piece of those objectives. So I would agree that sort of having a mandated objective doesn't intuitively feel like the sort of right thing to do. But I think we have to be mindful of where we are in this journey and where we've come from and why we have to mandate objectives in the first place. But I think that's step one, you know, we've got the, the objectives mandated, but it is up to those leaders looking at those reports to ensure that those objectives are realistic, that they and they, that they are deliverable, and that sort of speaks to the cultural uh, sort of component that I was talking about earlier, and the shift in the organisation to really double down on ensuring that we are developing an inclusive culture, and diversity and inclusion is part of the culture of the organisation. It's not just sort of subset or sort of standalone thing. So we don't look sort of culture over here and diversity and inclusion over there, but. Um, Thinking about the objectives, I will say that there is a personal commitment by our sort of ECAB members to have objectives that are deliverable. Um, our senior leadership is meeting um, next week. Um, objectives will be part of that and they will be held accountable um, for those objectives because I think there is there is an understanding of kind of where we are at the moment that, you know, we kind of have this this kind of objective and it's just a bit of mm, well we do it every year we can copy and paste it 
but nobody is that accountability. And that's part of our cultural model. Who is accountable and who holds people accountable? And, you know, it's sort of refreshing to see that I think at the top of the organization, not only is this being done, I think, but the resources are being implemented, the resources are being put forward to make sure that this happens because we can't do any of this without resources and giving people the time and the space and the tools to do it. So I think there's definitely a shift away from this being a sort of, um, a sort of regular, dare I say, sort of tick box um, sort of exercise to one in which people will be held accountable for what they have identified that needs to be done. Brilliant, Dr. Melissa, thank you. Um, Arwa, what about an external sort of uh, organisational view where you've seen good practice elsewhere, or is this a, is this a common challenge and problem? I, I think it definitely is a common uh, problem. And I think the issue, as is, you say, sort of, is sort of this cult cut and paste objectives rather than really tailoring it to the organization and I think what really works is you know there's so many people in every organization with so many great ideas about how to change things um, and often those ideas aren't listened to so again it is about not having some you know cut and paste objective but I mean objectives are very important you definitely need to have something even if it turns out to be wrong and you iterate but again tailoring it for your organization and listening to people about what that objective should be um, finding ways to surface those ideas from within your organization sounds simple can be some of the hard like is actually very hard to operationalize um, and ensuring that you are getting the point of view of every single person not just the people who kind of have the loudest voices but again i think it's re recognizing that there is no silver bullet like you can't change things overnight is that being able nobody expects you to get everything right immediately but people do expect that accountability and they expect transparency transparency is so important just sharing what went wrong and how you're going to change um so yeah that that sort of transparency transparency in the dialogue is a um you know an important component of it and it being a journey that everyone's going on together so I think I, you know, I take away from that that we we acknowledge that we haven't necessarily got the mechanism right yet, but this is about setting the conditions. And if it only suits the loud extroverts of the organisations, then we need to look at what the other opportunities are to understand how we address the behaviours, how we make sure they are looked at at every single level throughout the organisation, uh, and that it's you know something we can we can hold people accountable to as well. Thank you. Um, the next question we're going to look at is about personality and how uh, we alter this, this mindset of potentially selecting in one's own image um, and reinforcing, therefore, specific stereotypes um, and, and how this affects genuine diversity. Um, and I, I will come to um, Army Sant Major in, in a minute, uh, probably back to Professor Adrian again as well, please. Um, just to talk about as well, not just that, but then when we look at our regimental system and uh, the future soldier and everything that's just come out in the recent announcements, are we just reinventing the same challenge or actually do we think the future is something that we've, we've addressed this in and we're making sure that these are opportunities for all and we're not going to fall back into the same challenges. So the question really is about making sure we don't select in our own image um, and then how we, we make sure we don't fall into those stereotypes and things. Um, Want me to go? Yeah, if that's um, right. I think, I don't think that happens very often. I mean, I think the issue is people aren't in selection. People are, are usually working to a framework, a competency framework or some sort of framework. They're looking for a characteristic. Um, presumably, you've shown that that characteristic is predictive of successful behavior. So let's take an example, let's take introversion, extroversion, which doesn't predict very well, I might add. But let's assume there's pl plenty of evidence that extroverts make better leaders than introverts. As I say, that's not true, but let's assume that is true. There's evidence for this. And the organization, therefore, has told selectors to look for extroverts. I don't see anything wrong with that at all. If the people who have been selected are themselves extrovert. That selecting in one's image based on criteria we know are predictively successful. I don't think, you know, when people sit around and on a selection committee, they're not just, well, I, I don't think they are. They've got very clear criterion of what they're looking for. And somebody set those criteria, those personality and other variables, because they're known to be predictive. 
we know that certain characteristics make for better performance in some areas. Amen. That's very clear. So we look for those characteristics. So I don't think in, in, in the military or in many other organizations that you have this select in the own image. It, look, it might look like it if indeed people have been selected for a characteristic that is predictable of success. So if I, as a leader, have been chosen by some characteristic which is known to be successful, and I seem to therefore choose other people like me, that's not in my own image, it's selecting a, a variable which is known to relate to success. So I, I don't think that that occurs. It doesn't occur in many organizations. I mean, yes, you will sit in a room and you will have, we know how unreliable selection interviews are and the extent to which we pick up small variables. I think that's true. We have ways of dealing with that. But the idea of, you know, making a judgment on whether Mrs. Thatcher didn't like men with beards and that sort of thing. I don't think that occurs much anymore, but I stand to be corrected from your experience. Press agent, thank you. So if we take that and then look at it through the viewpoint, not just of our, all our soldiers, but also the regimental system and structures, cap badges and the like. Sergeant Major, what's your view? So I, I think when we, we come out of the senior NCO space and certainly the cause, we, we have a host of systems that, that uh, give us a level of assurance that we, we're not we're not just selecting the people that replicate us or, or, or look very much like us, that those reports moving to a separate position where a board is selected. Where I do see in the regimental system, you, you see some of this um, selection process and what, what is deemed good is what sets good. And I'll, I'll use uh, the infantry and it's, it's not to bash them. They're just so much more part of the regimental system. And, and you see, for example, where we are today, a sand, if you uh, see a Sandhurst instructor on someone's report, that is deemed great before you've even read the report. And so it's those little nuances there that I think we need to break up because we are very broad. What we deliver adds so much value. And for a soldier that looks good and is seen to be good in a unit because they're there compared to a soldier that might be going outside of their usual, um, their usual unit, developing a skill set, a, a level of diversity of understanding and thinking um, can sometimes feel like that they're uh, being penalized for that by not being in front of people and not being able to represent themselves. And I think we need to get better in that area. So, so it's really about organizational biases and being aware of where we might have a bias and, and, and what our blind spots are. I, I think that's exactly it. Okay, brilliant, thank you. So I'm going to move on to a question now about uh, when new in an organisation, uh, as a leader, uh, how one might challenge culture and, and things and indeed change culture uh, and a poor culture at that. Um, I mean, I would like to extend the question to suggest it's not just about being a leader in the organisation, but, but if you're new in any organisation, regardless of role. Um, uh, Rob, I'll come to you in an instant, in a minute, and then if we can go to you, Dr. Belissa, uh, and then I'll oh, probably back to you if that's all right for a view. Uh, Rob. Okay, so I would say, firstly, you need to have a deliberate approach. It's not something that can happen um, mm -hmm. you know, without a, a really uh, conscious effort. Um, so the sorts of things I would be um, doing is from the get go is, is and I mentioned it before, setting the example of, of the culture that you want to then uh, see permeated through, through the uh, through the organisation. And that is obviously particularly pertinent as a leader, but I think applies, as you say, uh, to anyone uh, joining joining a new organisation, but you need to identify and then champion those who who are already displaying the culture, who are likely to be your sort of trailblazers. Um, champion them, encourage them, and uh, and uh, seek to enable their um, strong influence across the team. You need to set out the case for change uh, and communicate it sort of with passion and consistency um, during during your time in the organisation. And within that case for change identify and then ruthlessly focus on the benefits case uh, and making sure that not only are the benefits understood but actually they're being seen to be delivered and then finally perhaps most difficult uh, most challengingly identify the blockers who is it that's going to be resistant who is perhaps part of the, the problem because or they don't get it and try and identify why what is it because yeah, it's probably their experience it may have been what they've got used to so how is it that you can engage with them to make them part of the solution rather than part of the problem. 
Brilliant, thank you. Dr. Belissa. So I agree with everything that Rob said um, previously. One of the things I would highlight is this question, or this question really, rather the issue that we have in our organisation of power and rank. Okay. So I think challenging in our organisation, particularly if you are new, is, you know, I think from my observations, very context dependent on where you are in the organization and how that will be received so notwithstanding the points that rob made i think the issue is around you know what are you challenging and what do you want to see what is the case for change and what are you um if you're new in the organization you know how do you come in and sort of support a conversation really around you know what your experience may have been elsewhere and what your experience is in this organization and as i kind of mentioned before just thinking through that that element of power that element of hierarchy if if the culture where you are is not one where people are receptive to sort of challenge and new ideas then there are other opportunities and mechanisms for you to raise those concerns to as i talked about you know kind of the speak out helpline the, the wider defense helpline the sort of looking at finding sort of allies elsewhere um, in the organization and particularly um for mentors and sort of just reading the sort of the the the, the kind of uh, culture where you where you are i think for um more senior individuals coming into the organization there is an expectation absolutely that they will challenge um, what they are currently seeing and really making that case for change in terms of what um what different alternatives may be and what good looks like and i think there are quite a few um uh, ways for us to do that, looking at the sort of the model of culture we have, this unit climate assessment, being able to sort of report things in in that way. So it might not be that someone's saying, actually, I'm going to sort of talk directly to someone. There may be opportunities sort of to provide that feedback and sort of for that to reach up to the more senior levels of the organisation. Brilliant. Dr. Bliss, thank you. Um, Awa. Yeah, I think that all those are brilliant points that sort of. Uh, kind of summed up everything I was going to say I think the um the benefit like making the case that you know change will be beneficial and that is not just change for the sake of it is so important because I think that is often the big hurdle of people not understanding why they need to change people thinking oh you know everything is great as it is because for them it is great as it is perhaps um so really kind of getting people to understand um you know the need to change change and and why you know showing that it's not just for the sake of it and I think you know when people work in different teams with different sorts of people like that's the, one of the most effective things when uh, they found that if you know people are working say on a volunteering project and senior people are working with less senior people and that you're working on a in a mixed group that's not on your um it, that's not in your usual work capacity then you learn from each other in different ways and you sort of um you understand each other on a more human level. Um, the more you know, like the more different people you interact with and you talk to, then you stop seeing changes like, oh, this is all wokeness. Uh, you start to realize like, oh no, I need to, like this is, you know, I understood this person's experience. I understood this person's experience. Like you start to realize this isn't like some sort of woke conspiracy. These are human beings. And all we're trying to do is just make everybody feel included so that we can all work to our best potential as a team. Um, and you can't do that when uh, you're divided. So. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. Um, we're going to have one last question, and I, I do appreciate we won't have covered off all the points today that people put forward, but but we're, we're going to end on this one, which was uh, addressing a point that uh, Professor Adrian mentioned, uh, which was about the fact that uh, change becomes more difficult as you get older. So we will come to, to uh, Dr. Adrian in a minute first on this. Uh, and then maybe um, Dr. Melissa, again, if, if you could talk about the organisational view and then 
on this art major if you if you're prepared to finish so so what i would propose is this is that you know we absolutely recognize that we are a bottom currently a bottom fed organization and a hierarchical structure um and, and all sorts of work is being uh conducted at the moment to look at different ways uh we could evolve as an organization uh so if it is the case that we are, uh, are more difficult to change as we get older um how do we uh, ensure that we continue to evolve at every level. So, 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 Dr. Adrian, if we, um, Professor Adrian, if we could come to you first, please. Um, I think it's definitely the case. Uh, as one gets older, one slows. But the, the problem often is that as you get older, you get more senior, and as you get more senior, you have a vested interest in keeping things as they are. So there's an ability to change and a willingness to change. I think you know the the data suggest as we get older we get slower and intellectually less less agile. That's the word. Agile is very popular in in uh, organisational sectors uh, because agility is thought of as a very uh, desirable characteristic. I mean, one thing I think uh, was a uh, point was made earlier is when you have very senior teams, it's a very good idea to have a very a much younger person on the team with their with their uh, particular perspective. Uh, on on the organization but the, the two things go together that as you get older you become less flexible and as you get older you get a bit more powerful and power usually means retaining things as they are so trying to bring somebody on board in the decision making at a higher level with you know a, a younger perspective possibly probably a younger person i think at least helps the the process uh it was kennedy you know the bay of pigs he he you, what you have is you have a devil's advocate and i would you know have a young person's devil's advocate to put a case each time for another perspective possibly from a younger perspective something like that thank you um dr melissa <clears throat> Well, I absolutely agree with um, what uh, Professor Burnham has said there. And I think I would add there that we we need to think about operational effectiveness. That needs to be the conversation that we're having in our organisation. So it is hierarchical. It is sort of um, uh, sort of power driven in in, in certain uh, sort of respects. But if we are thinking about how we change policy and how we change organizational culture, then we need to hear from as wide a range of voices as we possibly can. And I think to that end, sort of my team um, is sort of responsible for bringing in the voice of our sort of employee support networks to those decision makers, to the senior leaders of the organization. So our service women's network, our parents network, our multicultural network, our LGBT network, um, who generally would be people who are potentially a lot younger than um, some of our leaders. So when we are looking at policy development, when we're looking at inclusion, when we're looking at some of the things that we want to do, we do need to have those voices. And we're doing that by bringing that um, into the decision-making uh, sort of sphere. So I, um, I, I think we're in an organization where we're we're moving every couple of years so to change it for, certainly for the army is is quite common to us and we really don't ever sit in power like like adrian discussed for long enough not to uh to, to want to do something with that time period i think we need to ensure that we explain why we need to change and the necessity for it and show that I, i'm a great example i uh, in the royal engineers which is doesn't have many uh, females in it. And it wasn't until I met my wife uh, in my mid thirties that, that I really learned the importance of, of the value um, that, that her cat badge in the AGC added to us as a work. It, it, they felt like they were just a, a group that delivered um, work for us and supported us. Well, actually, when you break down and then suddenly start to get to know people, what they deliver to us, we're a small team now compared to the army of years before. There's no space for no one in this team. So we need to show that to people. And I go back to the regimental system and breaking people out of that and seeing why it's necessary for our team to be inclusive and the value that we add to everyone in that. So I disagree that um, a little bit that um, we don't uh, seek change and it's harder as we get older. But then I guess, Adrian, I'm only 42. So um, <laughs> I, I keep looking out for it. Thank you very much.
Um, we are going to uh, stop at this point uh, in order to uh, give you all a chance to go off and get some lunch and we will reconvene at two o'clock, 1400 hours. Um, you're very welcome to, to drop out and dial back in, uh, but likewise you can remain uh, dialed in if that is your preference. Can I just re-highlight in case uh, you didn't hear at the start, we would, we would love to encourage those of you that can uh, to make a donation towards the Army Benevolent Fund. Uh, we clearly, there is no charge for this conference, um, but if you feel uh, that you can and would like to, uh, then the details of the Army Benevolent Fund will be put into the chat box um, uh, in a minute. Um, this afternoon, uh, there are a huge amount of uh, exciting people that are coming to talk to us. We've got Kate Richardson Walsh, uh, a, a gold medalist uh, and hockey player, Lisa Smith, uh, a partner in UK Deloitte, uh, Major General James Martin, who's recently taken over as the General Officer Commanding uh, Three Division, and then uh, finally Simon Sinek, uh, the author and inspirational speaker. Um, can I also just highlight to you as well, everything that's happened thus far and will happen this afternoon will be available uh, in about a week's time on the Centre for Army Leadership's YouTube channel. But suffice to say, for, for all of our speakers that have joined us uh, this morning, thank you all so much for all that you have contributed. Um, I leave you with this challenge. How much are we prepared to change both as individuals and then as part of the journey, uh, as, as it was referred to earlier, that we're in the foothills of, and this is very much part of the evolution in order to get our organization and indeed your organizations into the best possible place that we can. So what is the challenge function you've got in place and how much are you prepared to change your own leadership? Thank you. <laughs>